I'm a little bit behind the curve today, so you can see what I do here live, just as a bit of a behind the scenes. Welcome, I hope that you can hear me. If you can't hear me, say so. I'm sure you will, because you'll see my lips moving and you won't hear my voice. If you can hear me, say so. Uh, and then that's good. So I've set the stream name, I've read my guidelines, I know what I shouldn't say. We're not using Streamlabs today. Oh, I say that, maybe we should. Let's just have a little play with Streamlabs today for the first time. So we'll do that. You can see behind the scenes on Streamlabs. So we'll do that, log in with Twitch. Uh, Resilio's off, Backblaze, uh, yep, that's all good. Radio mic, don't know, can you hear me? Should be able to. Um, Zoom audio, we're not using it. Camera focus is good. Necessary programs are good. OBS Twitch key is all good. We're not using OBS. Um, my sign is on. I better let the house know that I'm streaming. All good. So we're good in that respect. Now, we have some uh, widgets. What shall we go for? Let's go for a Streamlab widget for the first time ever. I've introduced donations. We can do donations now. Um, not sure how any of this stuff works. I'm just going to go with the jar, I think. It's a simple little thing. So let's just launch the jar. It's a bit rubbish unless you're using OBS, but let's just play with this just for fun today. What are we going to get? Are we going to get a jar on a horrible green background? We are. That looks pretty ugly, but I might leave it on the screen just for fun. So if anybody donates or does various things, it should fill that jar up. Anyway, audio and video tight. Good. That's good to know. Good to know that the technology is working. We'll leave that down there just for fun, see if anything happens with it. And I will crack on with the um, RPG basically. So the repo for everybody who cares is here, boom, into the chat and let's open it. Let's just make sure I'm in the right place from a version control point of view. One day we'll stream properly with all the right tools and overlays and everything, but one step at a time. I'm trying to release the complexity of what we do slowly. Uh, prove that streaming's worth doing in the first place, um, get the general principles right, decide what we're doing before we get too into the details of how we do it. So fast and loose, scrappy at first. Oh, forgot to do my makeup, that should be on my checklist. Stop thy bald forehead from reflecting the ceiling lights too much. All right, so RPG, uh, this, this new model of producing the RPG is here. Uh, given you the repo link, we will be on stream. I think we're on stream nine today. We'll soon see from the uh, repository when it opens, when it finally opens. And then I'll open Unity and we'll be good to go. So each stream has its own branch. The branches are unmerged at the moment. We're on stream 10 as it happens. So let's just branch off here at stream 10. Um, of course, we're not branching off to the side because they're all the same history. So these are just tags effectively on the same history line. But it does mean that if I want to do something with the course production, I've got some, some data and information. So here I am. This is the commit we, I'm working off, added the most basic inventory class, which is I think what we did. And uh, let's open Unity. Let's see how it goes. You were just catching up on the Factorio stream. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed being a part of it. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool, wasn't it? Sorry there were technical issues halfway through. We're still not sure exactly what all the links that are required to stream well are. I seem to be able to do it at finally. Uh, after a lot of failing. Um, we think now it may be broadband contention issues. It could, be it could have been local network issues for Sam. Thing with streaming is it's all gotta go right. Anything goes wrong, chain's only as strong as its weakest link, right? Just like you guys making your games, your games are only as good as the weakest link. If that's marketing, if that's naming, if that's your thumbnail, if that's the title of your game, if that's your ability to program or to write story or to create art, whatever it is, your game's only as good as its weakest link, so please guys work on your weakest links. So a new thing on our page, you're able to donate to support the continued efforts of streaming if you want to, if anybody wants to try that. There's a Streamlab system, you can donate through PayPal. Uh, I think it will appear in this ugly green jar. It's green by the way, because I think it's designed to be an overlay. I think it's designed to go and be chroma keyed out. But we haven't got there yet, because I'm releasing the technology layers one at a time so that we get that underlying layer stable, right? The first thing is that fundamentally my broadband's got to be stable. Um, and you know, our encoding settings have got to be stable, and, and then we'll kind of add layers of complexity. If we have too much complexity, then finding issues when they occur is hard. Anyway, I digress while Unity loads. So that's what I'm doing. I'm loading uh, this project at the state of the repo that uh, I have put in the chat, and I am going to start by clearing some to-dos, or at least reviewing some to-dos. So because I want to kind of reacquaint myself with the project, get back into it, it's been a couple of days, so that's what I'm going to do. So I need to get the repo up again, if for some reason it's disappeared. There you go. 
and I'm gonna, I do a pre-commit, that's my, what I do, there's one of the reasons I like source tree, there's many, many reasons I like source tree, um, you know, it can use uh, Bitbucket as a back end, you don't have to use GitHub if you want to keep your stuff private and not pay money for that, it's stable, it's good, it works, um, it'd be nice if it had a dark theme, it may have a dark theme these days, actually, um, I don't know if it does, but um, Git Kraken, I think the main thing I like about Git Kraken as an alternative is it has a dark theme, and look, here you go, there is a dark theme, boom. I don't know if their dark theme is finished and consistent. It looks a bit weird to me. Um, but let's go for the dark theme just for fun. So overall, Source Tree is my recommended version control front end. I really like it. It's not quite finished, their dark theme. They shouldn't really be leaving white highlights like that. So dudes, sort it out. Anyway, um, let's pre-commit the idea that I am uh, reviewing all to-do items as a starting point. Hey, Frank K. Frank, oh, BMTL. What's the BMTL about, Frank? Generally, I'm preferring dark. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the dark side. So I'm not sure what it is. Yoda must have failed in his mission to keep me on the light side. I seem to be going to the dark side when it comes to these things. All right, I'm going to open Visual Studio. I've still got this issue with Visual Studio spawning multiple instances on the Mac. Um, yeah, I know I should get a PC. I really am still in the Mac camp. I just It is a PC if I want to boot in Windows, right? So I've got the best of both worlds. Pay a little bit extra for the hardware, get pretty good service, yada, yada. Let's not argue about it. They're the same things at the end of the day these days. They're just different bundles of Intel-based hardware. Updates. Don't need updates at the moment. Let's go for here. You have Mac never... Sp yeah, my Mac never used to spawn more than one version of Visual Studio. I have removed and reinstalled both Unity and Visual Studio. I am not knowing what has happened. When I finally invest in a Mac Pro, I'll do it for the first time in 15 years. I, I haven't, and this is something that never happens on a Windows machine, right? Is that I have not changed my Mac setup in 15 years. <laughs> I got a Mac probably literally 15 years ago, an iMac, and from then I've just rolled Time Machine backups onto the next machine again and again. And my setup has been stable and evolved to <laughs> this over 15 years. It's kind of ridiculous. But I think I will go for a fresh start when I get a new machine. Just, um, just for fun, really, because I know how to party. All right, I'm going to go and have a look for to-dos. Oh, that's not what I intended to do, but now that I went full screen with, what was that, command F? Hello. Oh, by the way, the lip sync uh, should be better, and it should be better for all of us. Uh, the problem we had with lip sync is that our audio was going through Rode mics, and the video is going from a SLR camera through something called a cam link, which goes from HDMI to USB and then into the computer, and the video signal was delayed while it encoded and messed around, and so therefore video was behind. Hopefully now my lip sync's pretty good. Let me know in the chat if the lip sync is great, so-so, or I think it should be somewhere between great and so-so, which is good. And all of us should be like that now as well, because we're all using lapel mics. Hopefully that's what you're hearing me through. It's very convoluted the way I'm having to make this work. But anyway, it's all good fun. Recommendation for software on a Mac, sound control. This thing here lets you choose what apps root where and, and what volume they are. Good bit of software. Glad that the lip sync's good. And hey, Jesse from Ottawa, great to have you here. Um, to build something rather than... Yep, yeah, you're quite right, JXR. I love that about PCs. I love that you get to choose what you put together, the, the combination of hardware you get to put together. I love the, thing, the, the PCs I've built next door, water-cooled. They're pretty cool, nice. I, I, I get it all, I get it all. Never as beautiful and succinct as a Mac at the end of the day, though. So. All right, let's look for to-dos with not Control-F, but Control-Shift-F, otherwise I end up full-screening the app that I was on. And just quickly going to whip through, reacquaint myself, and get going. Uh, I'm actually going to... Last time I went through to-dos, um, I did it in a, in a fuzzy way. I went down, from, uh, I didn't go one at a time strictly. I went through them in a kind of, oh, I'm looking for something that I think I may have forgotten about. This time I'm just briefly going to go through them. So, to-do, ensure that you can click through a dialog box or close box before moving in the camera UI. Let's see if we can reproduce this issue. Ensure I can click through a, I don't think I mean dialog, I think, I think I mean text. Let's... Let's see what happens. I think this issue is that we've got a couple of bo new boxes on our screen. One is in this area, um, just where I'm going around with the mouse, and the other is at the top here. And the question is, can we actually click there? And it's about whether we're ignoring raycasts. And we can only remember there's two things. You have to, it will only stop walking to somewhere where, to where to where there is a pathfinding. Um, solution. So it's got to be able to get himself to that place. But yeah, this is where the dialogue is, and I am able to click. Oh, not when the dialogue's live, I'm not. All right, so I, oh, it's inconsistent. Let's have a look. 
No good trying to fix a bug or an issue until you get the reproduction conditions first. Is that inside the dialog box where I am there? Let's have a look in the scene. 2D, um, and then I need to zoom to the game canvas. Come on, Unity, you know you can zoom out. It's just pausing for whatever reason. Why the big pause, said the hunter to the bear or something. Uh, the quest list, the dialogue. Yeah, I was definitely inside the dialogue. See that square there you're seeing? That dialogue I'm able to click through, so that is good. So I'm happy to remove this to do, uh, and it'll come up again in playtesting if we have an issue. So let's save that one. Let's move to the next one. Remove side effects of these calls. We're really going back into old code here. So this is the camera raycaster. This is the thing that as I move around and I mouse around the screen is firing a ray through the screen as if through the camera, straight through the cursor, hitting the world and seeing what it hits. And I've got a to-do, which is the start of shared code. Oh, uh, yeah, I remember this. This was relatively recent. This is where uh, we realized that the code that raycasts for something that has a voice object on it, i.e. somebody I can talk to, is basically exactly the same as the code that raycasts for an enemy, which is very similar to the code that raycasts for voice. Uh, sorry, for, for potentially walkable. Certainly those two bits of code I've got highlighted there are... Are they identical? I don't... Yeah, they pretty much are identical. They only vary in this type here. Oh, and the cursor. Oh, that's the bit that I haven't resolved then, is that I could make this a generic method, switching out voice to enemy AI, if it wasn't for the fact there are different cursors. Okay, I'm going to choose to not do this now because I haven't got the third thing. When there's the third thing that looks exactly like these two, then I will do it. Remember, you refactor on the third. So it would be a little bit too early to mess around doing it now, and it's not going to drive my project forward. So I'm going to bow out of that one. Thanks, but no thanks. Start of shared code is the same to do as... No, it's not. I'm mixing two things. Remove the side effects of these calls. Raycast for enemy. So this, this is the start of shared code. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that. This is not a to-do. A to start of shared code is not a good to-do, right? What it's saying is make generic raycast for voice method. Um, that, those two comments are the same. Raycast for type. That's what I wanted. Don't need end of shared code. Cool. Let's just redo the search so that my... I've got... There you go. The separate issue is I need to remove the side effects of these raycast calls. So I suspect what's happening over here is always raycasting, fundamentally raycasting, seems to always do two things. When you raycast, you are often saying, number one, am I hitting anything or anything of interest? And then number two, what am I hitting and tell me about it? And one of the problems with raycast calls, which is why you nearly all in all engines end up with out parameters, is that they do those two things, and I like to separate them. They're often, the, the signature of a raycast call in both Unity and Unreal is bool, raycast, or line trace, and then something that has an out parameter. And that just shows you, that's another thing I don't like about out parameters. One is that you expect parameters to tell a method how to operate, not to actually return you information. And number two, it's a sneaky way of having a method do two things. Right? If you say bool, raycast for something, and then in the brackets you have out hit result, a hit res an out parameter, you are not only answering the question, have I hit the thing of interest, given my, my, my raycast conditions, but you're also saying, give me back the thing that I hit, give me information. Feels like you ought to do two separate calls. So when we uh, raycast for voice here, we are producing a hit info. This is the out parameter, boom. Um, we are throwing away the, the whether or not we hit anything. If we go bar var is hit equals that, I think you'll find that will come back as a Boolean. There you go. So this is, we're throwing that away, which I actually don't mind. I like that because I'm saying, well, actually, I'm not answering the question whether I hit anything. I'm just saying, this is the thing I hit. And then I go and try and get the voice component off it. And if that fails, then the thing I hit doesn't have a voice. Therefore, we're not hitting something with a voice. So this fails. And then we don't set the cursor to a talk, talk cursor and broadcast that voice hit event. So my concern is these things have side effects, which is that we're not really just raycasting for voice. You see, the nasty thing here is I say, oops, huh, whatever I did there, that was a cool tool. I'm saying if raycast for voice, and then I'm getting a Boolean result back and saying, well, what on earth is going on here? That's horrible. This is why I've put the to-do in. Forget this side of th th this comment, but this is horrible. If raycast for voice return, 
So it's saying, if I succeed in, if the first thing that the ray that goes through the screen hits is a game object that has a voice component on it, i.e. a person I can speak to, rather than say the ground behind them, then return. Sure, i.e. don't perform any behavior about it being uh, an enemy or potentially walkable. This is a, a kind of moral decision, as I said in that comment I just deleted, that voice is higher priority than enemy is higher priority than, than walkable. So talk first, then talk, fight enemies, then walk. It's a bit like the aviation um, adage, which is aviate, navigate, communicate. That's our clear set of priorities in an aircraft. You know, you first thing if something's going wrong, is you aviate, you keep the plane in the air. You know, that guy who hit Sully when he hit the, uh, the birds, his th first thing would have been, um, let's aviate, let's fly the aircraft, let's not stall, let's work out where we're landing this thing. Number two, it would have been navigate, no choice when your engines are failed. It's not really about navigation, so then it would be communicate last. And the last priority they had was talking and communicating. He was so terse, he was like, it's going to be the Hudson. That's all he said, because he was focused on keeping his airspeed, his glide ratio right, keeping the thing in the air. So with, the, um, with this coding here, we're saying we have a clear set of priorities, and we're making a decision that we talk to people first, then we work on enemies, then we work on walkable. Anyway, what I don't like is the fact that um, this has a massive side effect. We're not just answering a question, have I hit voice? But we're changing the cursor and we're making a, we're making a, uh, a, we're raising an event that can be, can be any other class actually can subscribe to that delegate. And then lots and lots of side effects. So we might just better change this with naming, but I do not like this. So if Raycast for voice return. Suggestions on better name, naming, guys? Let's have a look in the chat. Hello, uh, I can't even pronounce your handle, I'm afraid. Are you a ZK? Anyway, lovely to have you here. What a shameless plug. I would like to thank you for the rest of the team for courses. I've got a nice job in the game dis industry to celebrate it. I've made a little trailer video. Sure, that's cool. Thank you for shaming, no, uh, shaming, sharing, and shaming. Um, of course, that's, you're very welcome, and thank you for thanking us for helping you help us. <laughs> or something. Anyway, I, I, I can't stand this name because it has horrible side effects. It does a lot more than Raycast for voice. So, um, maybe we just need to break this down. Maybe I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, I'm going to return voice hit instead of is voice hit return. This is the problem is it's doing two things. So let's try just return voice hit, which tells you whether or not you hit a voice object, right? Like so. All right. Then we are going to just uh, comment this out for a second. So then this thing is not Raycast for voice anymore, but it is rename. Where's the rename? Splodge R. Um, if voice if object with voice hit ah that's better pass the ray in if an object is with a voice is hit then i think we'd better do this behavior yeah let's try this if it's hit do this behavior oops so that is not return at all, but do this thing. Let's just be explicit about what we're doing and see how this feels. Take the comments off this, um, outdent those things. If you hit an object with a voice, do that and then return out of here. Then I think we're gonna go else if, makes it a bit bigger here, but it's not at all clear what was going on before. Else if, and then we need to rename this thing, um, which is raycast for enemy, so object with enemy AI hit, do what we do there, else if, do something else. But I don't have access to this voice hit object. Ugh, nasty. Raycast for interaction. Yeah, could be. Could be. This is not getting any better. So I'm going to back out and just, it's not getting any better at all. See, it's not about how to do it. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of ways to do it. The question is, what reads best. I'm going to try just a name change rather than a refactor to start with. Let's go all the way back to there and decide this. Spending a lot of time getting this code just looking right because we, we're going to be building on this a lot and I want it to be super clear. Teasing. 
Now, if you wanted to talk to the bad guy first. Now, what if you wanted to talk to the bad guy first? Uh, we do want to talk to the bad guy first. We've decided that. If we want to be able to change these, la these orders around, then yeah, we want a nice, simple um, way of reprioritizing these things. Yeah, I like interact, guys. If interact with voice, that, that's better. I think we'll go with that. If interact with voice, return. If inter, oops, is this renaming properly? Yes. Enemy AI, which is the name of the component, return. And if interact with or navigate to walkable, return. Aha, that's better. All right, we happy with that? That's clearer just with a rename, much lighter lifting. We're not removing the side effects of the calls, we're making them explicit. We, apart from I can't spell interact, which I'm sure one of you would have spotted. There you go. If we end up interacting with a vo voice object, an object, game object that has a voice on it, based on the ray that we've produced, then stop this particular ray casting. Or stop this, just return from this function. Otherwise, if we interact with an enemy, return. Okay, oh, that's better. I'm going to move on. And that it seems a lot better to me. Oops, to do, search for to do. Okay, we decided to make generic ray cast for type method later. Uh, I'm going to take it out as a to-do, just say consider, consider making. Okay, consider character scriptable object. Oh, we ought to think about that. So why am I saying consider a character scriptable object? Basically because I'm seeing a pattern in the character class of a load of serialized information here, which feels like it could go off into a separate uh, scriptable object. It's pretty easy to do, apart from we have to write getters for all of this stuff as we've talked about ad, ad nauseum. I think it's Latin until, until we're sick about it. Um, oh, we could move all this over into a scriptable object. The reason I'm not going to bother, am I going to bother? Um, let's have a look. Let's see how many different characters are specified using those parameters and whether we actually really want to have scriptable objects for this. So the player, under his character script here, will have all of these. This is the parameter space I'm talking about, all of this stuff here. So we're talking about that. And then we're talking about different enemy prefabs, like a archer, also having their own parameters here. And what we could do is link out to scriptable objects that we create, and we go RPG character config, and we have a bunch of configuration that we specify there. That's architectural heavy lifting, and I'm not seeing any plus side to it. It's not solving a pain right now. So I think I'm just going to take the to-do away. Oh, the stream still thinks we're playing Factorio. <laughs> well, I never did. Let's just sit, fix that. I did set the stream name, but sometimes it doesn't take... Uh, ah, you mean it thinks we're playing Factorio, exactly as you said. Thank you. We're not. Awesome. Thank you very much indeed. That should be fixed. All right, so we're not going to do that. Uh, what else? Consider specializing NPC movement. Uh, so the idea here is that the enemy AI is basically only doing, apart from the state of the enemy here, it's basically only doing movement. But again, we don't have any, you only refactor when you have some new functionality that it's hard to build on the foundations you've got. That's the main time I want to refactor. So again, I don't need to do that right now. Uh, consider persistence across scene loads with the quests. Um, we have considered it a lot. We will solve it when we actually do scene loading. So that can go. Reward coin. Uh, what's the to do here? Consider get set. We can't. We'd love to. We've tried it 100 times. We've changed our C-sharp version in Unity. We've messed around with getters and setters all day. The latest thing we've done is said, well, actually, maybe we make our life easier with regards to how we protect serialized fields by using the quick fix generate, encapsulate fields, but still use field like that, which is similar on the PC. And you end up with code like this. And then we decided that the code it produces is ugly. And we tried digging into Visual Studio settings and never found a way of doing it. So. 
Uh, example, other quest criteria to do. Um, yes, we need other quest types, but we've built out enough of them right now. Rick thinks we're not going to do a guest solve, and we're not going to do combo quests that are multifaceted. We've just got to downscope the course a little bit. We are going to want to be able to do a... Uh, we've done escort, so we can get rid of that. We are going to want to do a gather and a delivery quest type. Not quite yet, so that's that. Voices. Rename enemy canvas to NPC canvas. Why? Because... Because both enemies and NPCs share the same canvas? But I don't see enemy canvas. Let me just go and check in Unity. Go and have a look at a enemy. Any old enemy will do. Wow, Rick, so many people. And it's going to be a game object, and it's going to be called enemy canvas here. And then I think the concern we have is that if we look at the NPCs, and we look at one of those NPCs, they will have something else called enemy canvas, which doesn't really make sense. But there's not a single place we can rename enemy canvas to NPC canvas, because these are prefabs and we don't yet have nested prefabs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that out, but when we, get to, when we upgrade to the version of Unity, the stable version of Unity that uh, has nested prefabs, then at that point we can start to say there's a character prefab, and then we specialize that into enemy and NPC. And at the character prefab level, we'll have NPC or character canvas. Shouldn't really be enemy canvas anyway. It should be NPC canvas or enemy canvas. It should be character canvas. So we'll do that when we get to nested prefabs. Anybody tried the version of Unity that has nested prefabs yet, by the way? Thank you for letting me know that we're still playing Factorio. We're not. Um, the, the new course doesn't exist yet. I'm prototyping the new course. I'm giving you the really detailed every stream of consciousness, every single little decision that goes into making these courses so that if you want the real why behind the why and how do we get to the, um, you know, hopefully we make good courses, right? And hopefully the projects are pretty tight. Most people who look at the project structure and the code think it's nice. How do we get there? Uh, we, in the course, prototype a, a section and then we teach you how to get to that end result. And we teach you every step along the way, but we don't teach you the stuff behind the stuff, the thinking behind the thinking. And that's what we're, um, that's what we're doing today, is trying to uh, and in this whole stream series, is trying to get to the prototype of the RPG we need to teach, but also teach you the thinking behind the thinking. Uh, why am I opening a web browser right now? Oh, I was just going to boast about something. That was it. I was just going to show you that we have a new thing. If you look at the front page of our Twitch page, uh, there's a few things I just want to bring everybody's attention to. You can get to our courses there. Please buy our courses if you're not on them. You can see the schedule of upcoming events. I need to embellish that a little. Uh, you can see the top clips. Please clip, guys, and share the clips and name the clips. You can buy our gear. I'll put the cheapest stuff at the top. This is all the stuff we use to make ourselves amazing. Obviously, it doesn't work, but we're trying. Um, you can see our subscribers that we're really grateful to. I know there's a couple of new tier two subscribers that aren't on this list. We're getting to that. Uh, you can add our Twitches, your, our streams to your Google Calendar. There's the URL, gw.tv forward slash twitchcal. That'll update itself. Um, here's why you should become a tier three subscriber. That's really going to make a difference. And you can now donate at Streamlabs. I don't know if anybody's done that yet. If you donate live on this stream, I think we will have something appear in this ugly green uh, tip jar down there. So that would be pretty fun if anybody wants to do that. And that will support the ongoing streaming of the channel because, of course, we don't make much money from the streaming bit. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. I highly recommend anyone serious about Unity to move to 2018.2 and start using the new features. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, that should probably include me. We should probably take our own advice. So let me just see which version I am currently on. 2018.2. Uh, were you more specific? Oh, F2. Okay, I could probably go up a couple. Uh, that's okay. But the, not the beta, but the actual point two release. Yeah, I'm gonna. My main change is going to be 2018.3. I'm kind of going to wait to that, see that, see about the nested prefabs, and then go from there. Will Rick be choosing the ugly scene winners today? Oh, good question. Uh, he's getting pretty asleep right now. It'll be probably today or tomorrow. This is in preparation for uh, the pain is that. Basically, Unity stuff can look ugly out the box. The solution is the new tech art course that has just gone to our mailing list subscribers with Wilma Lim, um, who's been a professional writing and game designer for years. And he's teaching you how to make stuff that's actually properly pretty. I wonder if I can get you a preview of that as a quick, um, as a quick aside. Um, maybe not. I'm not quite sure. Uh, no. Give me another two seconds. I haven't been there recently enough. But anyway, you guys aren't quite allowed access to it yet unless you're on our mail list. But um, that's coming out in the next few days anyway. You'll be getting access to that tech art course as a brand new course. 
Anyway, saw the email a week before payday, um, all good news. Um, oh, it's the wrong time of month. We should probably s synchronize our emails with uh, the right time of the month. Anyway, I don't want to keep squirreling off from the, uh, from the project we're supposed to be working on. So good to have some side stuff, but let's, let's keep moving on. Uh, now, what's the problem here? Why is it yuck to go and find, oh, but probably the string reference. <laughs> no, I don't like there. Finding a dialog box by tag inside the voice.cs. Just go and look at the structure in Unity and see why this sucks. So we need to find somebody who has a voice. One of the easy ways is go to the player, uh, go to one of these guys, all of which have voices, uh, and just ask yourself the question, if you have a voice, you need to communicate direct to this dialog box in the world, which is currently tagged. There's only one dialog box. Finding it by tag is probably OK for now. So it's yuck, but I'm going to let go of it. Um, move towards, then speak. Uh, so this is asking the question, when we click on somebody who we want to speak to, should we move, navigate towards them before we start, start, before we start speaking? So if I'm a long way from this, what is he, purple dude, and I click on him, if I can even get a raycast through there, let's try this. Should I immediately start the conversation with him like this, or should I move to him and then start the conversation? I think that given that we can't actually create much distance in our scene, the way that our camera works, uh, I'm just going to start speaking to him because it's easier. And if Rick really wants us to uh, focus on moving there first, we'll bring that in as a new to-do and actually do it then. So I'm chomping through these guys quite nicely. And look into this still happening on the player. Yeah, so this issue is quite an interesting one. When you import from a um, asset pack any animation, then those animations might come with animation events we can see in here somewhere. This one I think does not. Let's have a look. No, it does not. But the supplier of the asset pack may have embedded named events in. Oh, there is an event. Look, shoot. There you go. Named events inside the animation. That's baked in as a string reference, which I love. And you will actually get an error because of the way our code works if there are any of these events in there. Now, what I decided to do is to strip the animation events out so that using an asset pack doesn't cause our code to give warnings. Now, I don't think it is right now giving any warnings. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think it's overkill at the moment, exactly. Cool, thank you, Dark Slade, for getting the lighting course. Let us know how you get on with it. I think it'll be awesome. So, uh, SRP trend plates are great for lighting, saw the email, yeah. All right, so let's just see if I'm getting these warnings. About. I'm not getting these warnings about animation events. So they came up temporarily. I was really confused when I translated to Unity 2018 why they came up, uh, and they've gone away. So anyway, the general principle is don't allow an asset pack to break your code, and the way we stopped it is by stripping animation events. Um, and we just cleared the array of animation events so that if an asset pack has a sneaky, has a sneaky little string reference animation event in it, well, then we strip them out, and if we really want to deal with them, then we can put some parameters in that say, hey, look for the shoot animation event, or look for the footfall animation event, or look for any animation event. That's cool. All right, so I've gone through the to-dos. That's nice. I'm going to commit that, and then I'm going to start looking at these warnings briefly, because uh, I don't like warnings. The problem is cry wolf, right? If you have too many warnings, you start looking past the warnings. If you start looking past warnings, eventually you start ignoring them, and then everything goes to boop. So that's what I'm doing there. Now, is it good if I occasionally zoom in and just show you the full amount of hair that I have on my face, or would you rather I just left it? Just let me know in the chat. That'd be cool. I have reviewed all the to-do items, and I'm pushing to Stream 10. So here's the link to the repo for those of you who have joined us recently. Glug, 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 glug. Oh, my back. My back. I keep... There's nothing wrong with my back, but one way or the other, I keep damaging it, whether it's Krav Maga, people kicking me, or falling off massive new pogo sticks or landing on the trampoline wrong. I've always got one reason why or another why my back is buggered. That's a word I think I'm allowed to occasionally use for emphasis on the stream with your permission. So review the to-do items. So what I'm going to do next is to just clear the, clear the warnings. So let's just do that. Let's just go through them one at a time. So, oh, there you go. We've got something. Destroy object is obsolete. Let's look at that. So this is an API change. Health system at line 83. I'm not going to click it because it's going to mess up Visual Studio. So I'm going to go find the health system. I'm going to go find line 83. And then I'm going to look and see 
It doesn't like me using a Unity Engine object dot destroy object. It wants me to use object dot destroy instead, which I can probably just find like this because object will be available. Is it the same API? I think it might be. I think it might be as simple as that. That should get rid of that error. Let's see if it does. So don't let these things hang around for too long. Oh, unapplied import settings. Okay, that was because I was messing around with this crossbow here and I must have changed something. Uh, it doesn't matter. I didn't change anything too significant, I don't think. It's just doing a re-import of this asset because when I messed around trying to tell you about animation events, I changed something. I think it's this function on here I changed. I think you had the animation event issue from the special ability. Weapon is stripping the animation event, but special abilities need to also perform the strip. Ah, that's good. That's good, Jen. Um, now, I've got a problem here. I've broken something, and I don't want the... Uh, I want to revert this file, basically, this crossbow. I didn't actually want to change the function name from shoot to that. That was just me fumbling the keys. So what we're going to do is we're going to reset that to the previous commit and then reopen Unity. So there's now that you've got to be using version control, guys, uh, and learn how to use it. Super, super important. So that when things like that happen, you can just roll back, right? I'm just going to close a blind. I'm becoming whiter and whiter as it gets brighter in here. So yeah, no need to let those things slip. Uh, just going to down, down expose myself a tad. Okay, so let's deal with that perceptual. I think what you're saying there is cool. Um, I, will, I will deal with that in just a moment. I think that you're probably right about the special abilities not stripping animation events. And well spotted, that means you've been digging into the code base and really looking at this. And I think that you're quite right. And it's probably just a simple call to remove animation events. Uh, project's default behavior is set to 3D and does not contain packable sprites. You spent 5.6 seconds, six, six, seven, sounds like a grumpy developer. 5.67 seconds searching for sprites. Consider setting sprite packing mode to disabled under Unity Project Editor. Well, that's quite kind of easy, isn't it? Project Editor, mode to speed up, um, sprite packing mode, default behavior, uh, yeah. Disabled, yeah, all right, thank you, Unity. So that's saved me a little bit of time. Am I getting any other warnings? Now, warnings in Unity can be a bit weird, right? I've got no warnings now if I play, but I bet if I quit and reopen Unity that I'll get warnings. It just seems to do some additional checks on the first time you run a project um, since you last opened Unity. I think, let's see. We had no warnings. Let's reopen Unity and let's see. While we're looking at warnings, so here's one that we didn't have a minute ago. The tree must use the soft occlusion saver, otherwise build building will not work right. Oh. Okay, this is one of these things, this is going to be fun. So you go find that game object by just searching for it. There's two of these, same tree. It must use the nature stroke soft occlusion shader. Tree soft occlusion. Uh, bark or leaves, probably leaves. See if, how that looks. Let's go find that tree, see how it looks, and see if the warning goes away. But you see how we got new warnings there when, when we started playing the game again, which is super strange in, to my mind. Um, that doesn't look right. These game objects do not look right at all. Uh, um, ah, but this is just over in our, we're in a different, oh no, we're in the same scene. What is this area? This is just like a little asset layout area that Rick's been messing around with. Um, let's just check the main game looks okay. Main game scene looks okay. I'll probably leave this to Rick to worry about the, the details of these asset textures. I'm a bit worried about some of these. Let's see if in the game world we have issues. We do. So, how of all of these assets suddenly died? What has changed? Um, Could it have been that sprite, te that texture setting that I just changed? Let's have a look. Nah, I don't believe it. Let's just try it. I don't think so. I don't think it's got anything to do with sprite packing. Sprite packing's 2D. It's nothing to do with that. I'm just wondering why we've suddenly got all these materials messed up. It's not going to be anything to do with this. 
Hmm, I'm not too worried because it's not my job here to be focusing on the function, uh, the, the visual look, but something has gone seriously wrong with all of these textures. Um, and we will leave that, I think, for Rick when he goes and does an audit of the assets. I'll find one, just see if I can find the root cause of one of these. It doesn't matter which one, that one there. What's the problem with this dude? Um, ah, look, a whole... That tree log has been changed to this. It was when I changed that shader type and I must have changed it on more game objects than I thought I changed it on. So um, let's just save Unity and just see what the version control changes here are. Polygon students, materials. It'll be because this material here, so notice how I had to save in Unity. That material there is being, gonna be being used on a whole bunch of stuff. If we were to go and find this, if we were to go Polygon uh, asset packs, polygon samples, Cinti, etc. So I'm looking for poly adventure material 01.mat. Let's see if I can copy that string from somewhere. That uh, string, shall I say? Do I need? No, I won't hit the button. Anyway, I'll just browse through it. Asset packs for students, polygon blah, or was it simple Cinti? Can't remember. Um, yeah. Polygon sample Cinti, uh, materials, and then polygon event. This one. It's the fact that if I then look at that material and I find the references in the scene, look how many things in the scene use that material. Lots and lots and lots of things, including that tree. So what's happened is I've changed this material here to, the, to a different type of shader and it's randomly messed up, up across the whole world. Again, version control comes to the rescue. Watch this. If I now uh, reset that material back to the previous commit, that's why it's important to have small commits. And we go into Unity, it should recognize, ah, fixed immediately, all right? Now that warning will come back, but of course, because Unity's a bit weird with this, it won't come back immediately, I bet, reckon. But if I was to close and reopen Unity, I'll get that warning about the tree, um, and I'm gonna see if I can solve it just on those trees now. Yes, an HDRI skybox would help the game look better. We're really not anywhere near making the, trying to make the game look great, um, but you're quite right, and that's, that, that's a nice idea. Uh, We'll be adding in the animation events at a later time. JXR181, um, it's really a question of deciding on not whether or not we take notice of animation events. What I want to do is opt in in code to listen to animation events of a certain string and centralize those strings into one place in code. So what we do is we strip, it's an opt-in rather than an opt-out, right? So we're going to go to an opt-in process where we say, okay, all of these different asset packs, all of these different assets may have a bunch of animation events. By default, we're going to ignore them. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, in one place in code, centralize all those string references and say, for each one we want to start taking notice of, we're going to say, there's an event called shoot, for example, or footstep, and we want to take notice of it. Therefore, we, we um, either exclude it when we remove, so we don't remove it, or we add it back in somehow. Um, so we haven't got to that yet, but that's the general principle we're going for, is that, that start off by just taking them all out so they don't cause errors, and then start re-opting in one at a time so that each one's thought about, if that makes sense. Hopefully that answered your question, maybe it did not. So we're back to this. See the, the side effect of trying to fix this warning. A particular tree, which I went and found that tree, must use the blast shader. I went and found the tree, and there's a real interesting, subtle issue here with Unity. When I found that tree, which is SM, well, how did I get it? I, got, I copied this. Let's just do exactly what I did to mess everything up. And this is why you need version control. And I went in here and I did, did a rookie error. And I clicked in here and I went, oh, these two trees, and I changed the shader. But look, really train your eye on this, guys. And guys, this is worth somebody clipping. If somebody could clip and share this bit, it will get a lot of other people out of trouble because I just made this mistake again. When you look at an inspector for a given game object, most of it is gray, apart from the bit at the top and this bit here, look, the material is not as gray. You see it's slightly lighter gray. I wanna remind you that, when, that this material, you're not changing a material instance, you are changing the material in here. It's kind of weird because everything else in here, you're changing instance properties of these two game objects. When I went in and said, oh, well, for these two trees, I multi-selected, I'll just switch the shader out. <laughs> I wasn't doing that. What I was actually doing was changing this material, which if I right click and say, find references on sheets in scene, there is approximately a beep load of, okay, in the, in the world. So be careful of that. 
is what I would, I would say. I don't know why Unity is only complaining about it for those two. It's because it's a tree. It's a tree that's using a material that, for which you can't get the right kind of occlusion and shadowing and lighting effects that you need to get. So that's what's going on there. So those two trees need a different material assigned to them. I don't want to change the material for everything. Um, so let's go have a look. Now looking at the trees, it's not this box. I don't want to go in there because I'm changing every single game object. I want to decide on the material that I'm actually applying. I need to open up materials and then decide actually is, it, is, is this the material that I want? Poly Adventure 1. No, it isn't. Have I got a better material? Don't know. Um, do I care about these two dead trees? Not particularly. Um, we can fix this later. The, the uh, dead pine tree, there you go, much better material. So both of these, or I could have multi-selected, both of these materials, this dash means that the elements vary. This guy has one uh, value, this guy has another value. The dash means the elements vary. I now go find the dead tree texture. So I could go look for dead or tree, boom. Now I will have resolved that error without breaking the whole freaking world and changing loads of shared textures. Make sense? Um, yeah, good, exactly. So hopefully you are learning extra stuff between the lines. This is a lot of learning between lines. Why do these dialogues look so ugly? It's conspicuously ugly so that we don't accidentally leave it in the game. It means that we don't need a to-do or a version or, or, or some other meta system to track our to-dos. We clearly need to change that stuff. Done. That is the to-do. So that's why that's left like that. All right, now I've slightly lost track of what I'm doing. We're clearing the warnings. Okay, we have cleared the warnings in terms of a play-by-play -play warning. There's three levels of warnings you can get in Unity. One is a play-by-play -play warning, which is if you play and you stop and you play and you stop, you clear all the warnings. Done. There were no warnings. Number two, level two of the warnings would be you reopen Unity, you're going to get another class of warnings because the first time you reopen your project, different checks get done. Let's look at that. So when I say clear warnings, I should qualify this. Uh, play to play. So that's done. Then there's um, first open warnings. These are the first open warnings. Boom. During the open, we are still getting uh, blah, blah, blah. We're still getting the issue with the tree. So what I did is I changed the material, but I never checked what type of shade of the material used. So let's go have a look. Both of you use a dead pine tree. Now, what I want to do first actually is say, where else in the world is dead pine tree used? Okay, so let's look for it. Find, in, find references. Aha, it's only those two trees. So now, at this point, I can go to the dead pine tree shader. I can say, let's give you nature occlusion leaves, for example, and we should be in good shape. We should have not only got rid of the open time warning, but we won't have broken the rest of the world, all right? So let's just reproduce that as opening and closing is relatively fast. Um, oh, look, we've got something in the tip jar. Wow, somebody has donated something. And I'm sorry it's green. Obviously, long term, it won't be. It'll be chroma keyed out. Thank you very much, by the way, for donating. Whoever did that, I'll look it up and find out. Really appreciate it. That helps us support the channel. Um, and that supports the channel. It doesn't help us support the channel, but you're supporting the channel. So thank you. And it's probably you, Perceptual. You do your, uh, but anyway. Unity should redesign how the range. So now I'm going through the first open checks. Uh, what are we seeing? Oh, you know what? It's also okay sometimes to say, stuff it. I can't be bothered. Um, it should be a nature soft occlusion tr tr shader. Learn to let go as well. As developers, we like to solve problems. It doesn't matter. In the big picture, I'm not driving the... Um, thank you, BitGaming, very much. Um, I, in the big picture, we're not driving the project forward, okay? So, uh, so one left. And then the final type of errors, the class of errors we can get, I can't do without committing, but I will show you because it's time to do a little stretch. So what I'm going to do is it's after clean um, and I'm not done. So done. This is done. Play to play is done. First open, there's one left and the after clean is not done. What do I mean by after clean? I'll show you. Let's close Unity and it will need to rebuild all the assets after this, but I'll do that while I stretch. Maybe pogo stick, maybe not. What do you want me to do during the break? Hand walks, pogo sticking, trampolining. Um, yeah, pogo stick, walking on my hands or trampolining, let me know and I will do that. And while I'm doing it, you guys don't just watch and laugh, but um, please move your own bodies, look after your own bodies, whatever that means to you. 
Anyway, so I have closed Unity. If I go like this in version control and I go git clean minus xdf, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to delete all of basically the library folder is what it comes down to. All the files that are not tracked by, um, by version control, all of the stuff that is derived. So when I delete this stuff, the Visual Studio, the CS Proj, I'm not so worried about that, but it'll, they'll all have their effects. But the one that will really have its effect, and I should probably close Visual Studio, is where we start deleting all the asset caches. So let's just go back here again, the .vs because I hadn't closed it. The library folder, having deleted the Unity library folder by doing that, because we don't track that because it has no value in it, it's all derived information. When I reopen the project, look what happens. It's going to do a massive, massive, matted. Oh, thank you very much for subscribing, uh, Svet, uh, Svet, uh, Svet, oh, what is that? Svet, Svet Laka, Sveti Laka, something like that. Uh, anyway, awesome. Thank you very much for subscribing. Um, note, yesterday, a subscribers noticed that you can actually get, have Amazon pay for your tier one sub, sub and then you can upgrade to a tier two where we link to you on the home page. We give you a nice two tier two uh, badge, etc. this business um, under your own cost. So that's pretty cool. You could, so Amazon pay the base cost, you pay the rest and we get 240% more subs. Anyway, what's happening here is Unity's reopening and it's busy compiling scripts. It's busy uh, reworking assets. Uh, and asset caches. When it finishes that, we'll probably get a whole bunch of other warnings. So there's at least three, three levels of warnings to clear. Load more value I didn't think we'd be adding in the stream. Somebody please clip that about the warnings. It'd be really awesome uh, so that we can uh, include it in the course and you, other people can find it. Okay, trampoline, J. Brown, 1981. Can do trampoline. Um, yeah, why not? Let's do that. It's not the best view because the camera's a little bit, you know, far away. Oh, could I just change the lens real quick? Maybe. So I'll be back in a sec. Maybe I could make it good. Won't be long. lens, the benefit of which is that it is a longer lens. It doesn't have to be used for, hey, hold on, if I'm doing this, I should maximize splodge F. So I have a macro lens, benefit of which it's a much longer lens. So it's going to be very strange changing the lens while I'm streaming. Will the camera like this? Will it do the camera any harm? I don't think it'll do the camera any harm. Will it like it? I don't know. Let's find out. Here we go. Ugh. Whoa, that's going to be out of focus. Macro lens, which is pretty crazy. Look at this. Well, I don't even know if I can focus it. There's my finger much closer up than you'd ever thought you wanted to see. <laughs> anyway, now if I open the blind, then we have in theory a longer lens. And then maybe you'll be able to see what's going on out there. We'll see. Make a quick break and then I shall crack into the project even further. I know we haven't shipped much functionality today. Guys, it won't be long, but anyway, let's see if I can get this guy working. <laughs> Not exactly in focus, I would say. Um, okay, how do you focus this thing? Probably better just sort the um, exposure out. It's well off at the moment. Be good if I can do this, it'd be good for future anyway. Really sure how you focus this guy. Ask my wife to make sure that no kids in compromised clothing situations end up in the stream, which would be good. Okay, so that's on the way. Let's just try and get this focused. I won't spend too long on this. Good to take a break. Guys, please stand up and take your own breaks while we do this because I really want you guys to look after your bodies. It's a very uh, sedentary job sitting uh, at a computer and it's quite important we look after ourselves. Now, can I make it focus further? How do you, come on. Is there a manual focus I can do? Must be. Somewhere. 0.4 millimeters to infinity, yeah. It's closer to infinity, I would say. It wants to focus on the, uh, on the window there. Okay. 
Not sure how to get this to focus. My kids had a similar trampoline. Yeah, it's really cool. We went to see some trampolines uh, and we went to get a couple of these supposedly safe spring-free things, as they're called, and they were rubbish. They just didn't bounce at all. So ended up getting one that's quite different. Right, give me two seconds. I need to just look at this lens. I'm really not sure how to make it uh, 0.19 to infinity. That can't help. Why can't I manual focus? What am I doing? I never use this lens, it's my wives. In fact, I didn't even, wives? How many wives have I got? One, I think. Um, how many wives am I allowed? It'd be nice if I was allowed more than one, I think. Not that there's anything wrong with my wife, but it would be awesome to have lots, but I think that's not ethical. Uh, oh man, maybe it doesn't even have manual, it must have manual focus. Don't be silly. Uh, oh, I go manual focus on the back of it. Technology, it's all so complicated, isn't it? It must be really hard for people. Oh, wow, wow, that's doing it. Apart from we're cropped in like mad now. How does that work? Some, no, something's gone wrong there. Oh, now it hasn't. Now it's ungone wrong. So now, finally, oh, I see what it's doing. It's zooming in so that I can see what I'm focusing on. That's pretty handy, isn't it? Yes, there you go. You can even see who the trampoline's made by. Berg, B-E-R-G. And then I think if I stop focusing, we will get, it'll zoom back out and we will be in good shape. Wow, that took ages. Come on, I've stopped focusing, camera. Ah, there you go. That's pretty good. That right there is pretty good. So if I turn my exposure down, maybe a little bit more, all right, I'm going to have to quickly go and do a trampoline. Am I still okay to do a quick five-minute trampoline session, given that it took that long to set up the camera, or would you guys rather um, rather I did it on the next on the next break? Because I feel like I've spent the entire break now just setting up the trampoline. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Do it or don't do it, because I want to respect your time. You're here to see me work on the RPG. By the way, Unity. And look, I'd have to go and do it. Unity is still messing around uh, with the the Im asset imports. So I'm going to go do it because, uh, well, I can't work on the project anyway. I will go do it. I'll see you in a second. It'll be fun. Uh, I, will take, I will take my phone and you'll still be able to talk to me in the chat, which could be interesting. Okay, let's go. The radio mic. Oh, actually, why am I walking all the way through the house when I can walk around the outside? Oh, the people walking. Oh. I should also probably aim the camera up just a little because... Hopefully going to spend some of the time in the air. All right, let's get the chat on the phone. And I might, I might do more of this kind of crazy streaming to my own personal channel at some point, but it's a question of time. Welcome to the chat. Hi. Um, it's pretty cool that I can do it from there without having to leave my... to move the camera off the desk. Now, hang on. This mic pack needs to go somewhere considerably more secure because I don't think it's going to survive the bouncing otherwise. Like on my belt. <laughs> Oh, wow, that spring is tight, that hurts. Ouch, okay. On the belt. So, what we're gonna do to check that you can hear me, I might actually have to take my shirt off, which will be a PR disaster for a stream, but who cares? Should be all right, somebody's just arrived. We have guests, we're popular. It might be Lucy, actually. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say a keyword, which is gonna prove that the audio is still working out here. The keyword is today, let's just call it, um, I don't know. Lead, L-E-A-D, or lead, L-E-A-D, anyway, that's the keyword, pop L-E-A-D in the chat, that will prove that you can hear what I'm saying, awesome, okay, uh, so what's the first thing you want to see me do, um, let's go, let's go, uh, I don't know, let's just go, tell me what you want me to do, something, um, pick, Let's just pick from the grid again then. Forward somersault, we've got two types of somersaults, forward and back, and then we've got traveling, forward and traveling. You can't see the travel because it's, there's actually a lot of um, front flip corkscrew. What's a front, oh, okay, so like a half twisting front flip. Um, the trampoline's really long is what I'm, why I'm pacing back and forth. Um, I'll try doing twisting somersaults. Okay, twisting somersaults. They, I'm gonna land anywhere but my feet, but that could be fun, let's try it twisting somersault. So the idea, I think, with the twisting somersault is you drop one arm halfway down. So a standard backflip would just be like so. If I then drop an arm halfway through that, then in theory, you start to twist. So that was halfway, and I should be able to do a full twist. 
Oh, no, what happened there? I didn't twist. I, end, I expected to end up facing the, the other way. I can do it better with a straight somersault. Let's just try a straight, straight back. Need a lot of height on this trampoline to get a straight back. Oh, wow. Okay, now in theory, if I drop an arm on that, what could possibly go wrong? Oh, I struggle to get more than a quarter twist. Let's try again. Oh. Oh, that was a, that was like a quarter twist. I need more work on the twisting somersaults. Um, I'll work on it. Okay. Uh, what are you watching here? You're watching me having a break. Guys, are you guys exercising while you watch me do this? Don't be a passive coder when I'm coding you code and don't be a passive exerciser when I'm exercising. Exercise. Um, I'm going to try a very nice seat drop. Let's see if we can do a good seat drop. Twisting seat drop. So a seat drop is just this. Just this, boom. Yeah, now if you straighten your body halfway in between that, you should be able to do this. I think it's called a cat twist. Boom, straight, back, and back. Not very neat, let's try again. And then I'm going to go code. Here, boom, twist, back. Oh. So that wasn't a somersault, but it was a twist. This trampoline's not actually that bouncy. I wanted to get a kind of proper one. Oh my god, I'm naked now. Um, but unfortunately, proper trampolines kill kids. And even though that makes the place a lot more peaceful, um, it's not really what we're after. So I'm coming back. <sighs> um, yeah, that's exercise. Walk into the kitchen, bit of stretching. Good to look in the distance, good for your eyes. Um, whatever it's, whatever's right for you, but uh, keep moving. That's what I would suggest. Okay, I'm nearly back. Uh. Oh. Okay, thanks guys. Has Unity finished what it was doing? This is how I work, by the way. This is, I'm not putting a show on for Twitch. I'm just showing you my day. Um, it is a lot of coding. Oh, well, that's weird. Look at that. Hey, should we do that for fun just for a little bit? Let's just leave it like this for a bit. Um, <laughs> it's a bit kind of scary, but... Uh, for a section of the stream, at least, let's just, um, which way do I focus? Oh, my, look at that, that's a bit tight. For a section of the stream, let's do this just for fun. Okay, you really want to zoom out now, camera, you're making me very self-conscious, there you go. Okay, cool, so same lens. Uh, I'll put the thing in the corner and we'll get back to some work. Anyway, thanks for, indulging me while I messed around. That's really quite cool. Apart from there's no depth of field whatsoever. I have to stand precisely in the right place. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Can I autofocus this now? No. Ah, <sighs> karate. Okay, what have we got? My latest blah clip alert ends with the best sound effect. <laughs> what sound effect did I make? Did I make a bad sound effect? I'm gonna have to watch the sound effect. Uh, my work workmates would appreciate me exercising here at work. As you drop one arm halfway down, so let's see the sound. They might not, you know, they might actually appreciate you. <laughs> As you drop one oh, arm that's halfway good. Down. Yeah, that's brilliant sound effect. Thanks for that. Um, just going to go to autofocus, see if we can autofocus this guy. What do you think about the right in on the face view? Bit, bit close, right? Whoa, that's sharp though. Wow. Okay, cool. So where were we? Checking the chat. Um, honestly, consider subscribing just for that. Be great. Or stick something in the tip jar. I feel like a busker here. It's crazy. Not, you know, not that I want a busker. It's just I feel like I am a busker. Karate's cool. Yeah, I do Krav Maga for self-defense. Uh, you could repurpose that sound for the hit sound of the enemy make after you power attack them. Yes, we probably could. I think repurposing stuff like that is always good fun. Although at some point you've got to think about art direction and say, you know, obviously we want things to be consistent. Anyway, look, what I wanted to show you about warnings was that when we reopen warn Unity, after a clean, after we've deleted the library folder, we get a load of issues. Inconsistent line endings, Windows, Mac, line endings, not too worried about that. It doesn't actually have any nasty side effects. So we'll live with the inconsistent line endings. Um, now, these are the useful things that they don't tell you about anywhere else. Special abilities line 49, energy component is assigned but never used. You know it's probably wrong, but let's go look at it. 
This is probably the fact that we make a variable that we assign in the inspector and that Visual Studio doesn't know that that is ever being um, initialized. So I will check, but that's probably what this error is. Special ability is line 49. Although the fact it's line 49 suggests it's down inside the class and that maybe actually that isn't the issue. Oh, what's happened here? Where's my solution file gone? Am I in the right place? RPG new model assets, yep. That's interesting. Okay, I am gonna open this from Unity this time. What's the file in question? Um, special abilities, okay, so I'll just open it from here. Okay, now we're style, awesome, it all sounds good. Yeah, I used to do Taekwondo, that was a lot of fun. Wow, this camera's really mad zoomed in like this. But hey, why not? Now, it may have to rebuild the solution, so it's just rebuilding the Visual Studio solution at this stage in the background, I would have thought. And then now we look at the special abilities and we look at line 48, and we find out about this redundant code. Energy component equals git component special abilities and then we never use it, you're quite, quite right. You see how we only got this information after doing a complete clean, yeah? We did not have any of this information beforehand, any of this helpful debugging. So I'm just gonna pre-commit what I'm doing, which is the final set of uh, error class. I am now cleaning, clearing after clean um, warnings. That's what I'm doing. All right, so you're right. It was right about that. What else have we got? Has animation import warnings. Uh, animation import settings for more details. Not sure how much I care um, about those. I'll leave that to Rick, I think. A lot of things have animation import warnings. Well, I hope you guys can't hear my stomach rumbling. It's my stomach saying, you've just done a lot of exercise, Ben, it's time to eat. You know what? Practically all of these are animation import warnings. Uh, we've got a couple of other never used. We've got uh, enemy AI line 27. So let's go find, hunt that down. Enemies, enemy AI. You know your folder structure's right if you can find things quickly. People were asking about folder structures yesterday. If you can find things quickly, your folder structure's right, I would say. Uh, line 27, um, that's not right. Enemy AI.cs, line 27, the private field AI enemy state. There is no such private field on line 27 of characters enemy is enemy AI. RPG characters AI enemy is never law. State, you mean this thing here. It is used. I'm gonna ignore that warning. Unless anybody else can see what's wrong with that. Um, okay, on audio trigger CS uh, line seven, we have an issue. So core, audio trigger CS line seven. Layer filter is assigned to but never used. Now you're quite right about that. We do not use it. If we don't use it, if we don't need it, then we need to delete it because it's dead code. Good job. And then finally, escort follow handle is assigned but never used in escort. So quest completion, escort line 15. So dialogue and quests, quest completion, escort line 15. Follow handle, so we can stop it surgically. Okay, that was because I was showing you something. I was showing you that if you start a co-routine, it returns a handle by which you can get back to that running code routine and you could stop it. Um, you're quite right, it is dead code, don't leave dead code in. I know that, I'll tell you that again when we need to know. So I'm just gonna delete that stuff because it's quite right. We are not needing to stop that code routine at the moment, so why are we keeping the handle? It's just code that's hanging around for no reason. Okay, so now if I play, if I play on a scene is more telling. We should have no particular issues. We've got a bunch of animation import issues. Don't know how much I care. At some point you've got to stop caring and start building again. Um, Narki89, thanks for subscribing. How were you the chap a moment ago who said you were thinking of subscribing just because um, I came and was doing crazy exercise? Yes, it was, thank you, so awesome. Glad it's worth doing some crazy stuff. Talking about crazy stuff, my daughter's just rocked up at the door on, a, on an electric unicycle, um, which, yes, it's all a bit of a madhouse here. All right, so look, we're done. Finally, that was a long, long answer to a short like intention, which is I'm gonna start this 
by just getting on top of my warnings, but we've learned there's multiple different places and levels that warnings can uh, come up and that you need to go through not only play-by-play -play warnings, but a first project open warning, but also an after clean set of warnings. Oh, these eyes in here are a bit strange. Okay, so I'm gonna commit. Ah, oh, I am disastrously hungry now. This is my only one meal a day coming back to bite me. Getting to the point where I can't concentrate hungry, um, but we'll be all right. I shall not break until four or 5 p.m. Got barbecue tonight, that's gonna be fun. All right, so now we need to drive the project forward a little bit. So one way, once you've done, you know, you've done enough of a clean up, you felt you've got back into it, you've, uh, are you procrastinating or preparing? Don't know. Allow yourself a bit of procrastination, but when it turns into, um, oh, let, me, let me try and specify this a bit better. Procrastinating and preparing feel very similar. And if you're procrastinating, it's often give yourself the leeway and say, well, actually I'm, I'm procrastinating because I need to, because I'm not ready for something. I don't have the information, I don't have the inspiration to move forward in the way I wanna move forward. So don't be hard on yourself if you are doing something that somebody else might judge as procrastinating, like I could be doing now. I'm just getting back in the project, I'm moving forward, I'm doing stuff, and that stuff is moving me forward both mentally and emotionally. So don't worry about, about that. At some point, of course, you need to get the results done as well, but if you need to prepare for those, then that's fine. Just allow yourself the space and the time to do it. So just don't beat yourself up. Just keep raising your self-confidence. That's what I would say. I'm really not digging this camera angle. What are you guys thinking of this super close-in camera angle? It's only because I didn't bother changing the lens back. Is this crazy? I could actually move the camera right over there. Whoa, it's probably going to fall off the table now. That'd be bad. That'd be really bad. But is this, it's far too close, surely, but maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe we can live with it for a bit. It's different, different often good. Well, it's sharp. I prefer where you typically have it. Yeah, I prefer where I typically have it too, but just, uh, well, then I'll switch the lens. Quick and easy to fix. One, two, red dot to red dot, buckle my shoe, three, four. Just let the camera adjust. Help, what happened to me? Everything changed suddenly. Much better, right? Focus it and off we go. It's quite easy to change lenses though, that's good to know for future. So guys, what would you like to see us do next? Because we need to drive this guy forward. Uh, oh, look at this, we've got, a, we've got a proper error here. The variable quest parent of journal has not been assigned. We need to fix that out up. This is because, now this is the problem with having two scenes that look very similar. I would like to delete Rick's village because it's not the one we've been working on. So I'm gonna put in delete and then go back to village two. The problem is in Rick's village, it looks visually similar, it shouldn't be, it's too, it's too similar. I need to get Rick in here and say, look, let's commit to one of these villages or the other. The problem was in Rick's village, those characters weren't connected to the quest objects. All right, so that was that error. Well, thank you for changing the, uh, the, the angle of the camera, I guess you're saying. Hopefully it's better, yeah. Uh, escape the pen. Um, <clears throat> inventory. Escort quests. Um, and a kill quest on this guy, didn't we? Yep. And of course we can still kill him. That, that floating, did anybody get to the bottom of the floating after you kill an NPC, why they float across the ground in their, in their uh, RPGs? Got a warning, Unity showed me a half rendered red warning in the background there, but that seems to go away after I play again, so that's good news. All right guys, tell me, what would you like us to do next? Because I've got quite open-ended here. We can go deeper into quests, we can start looking on the inventory system, um, it's kind of six and one and half a dozen of another. Should we finish quests? We can't really finish quests in isolation because they interlock with other systems. Do you want us to go into inventory? What are you working on in your game that you would most like help with? Because we've got a handful of things to do. I don't really mind what I go into next. Let's customize it to what you guys are uh, wanting. By the way, thank you for all the donations. Again, I'm really grateful for those. That's really cool that that actually works. And I promise I'll get rid of the green minging stuff at some point as soon as I uh, work out how while still using my piece of dedicated hardware, which I like so much. 
uh, happens when you're... Oh, you know what, perceptual lucidity. Um, happens, it happens if you're... What happens if your agent destination is past the character target, like when your character moves closer from the point where you originally clicked? Oh, I see. If your agent destination is past the character target when the character moves closer to you. Yeah, yeah. The slipping. All right, thank you for the clarification. That's cool. But there's also, I've still got a backlog of, of valuable stuff to work on uh, of, of yours. Oops, I've accidentally clicked on you and now I've got to maximize in order to close you. Um, which is that you were telling us why that we had animation event issues on special abilities. So let's fire a special ability and fix that. In fact, let's pre-commit that that's what we're doing right now. So fix animation event issue on special ability. Okay. Went in a different direction. You're trying to make the movement and turning around good. Cool. Good luck with that. Svet, 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 svet like us, svet like us, svet like us, something like that. Anyway, let's get rid of this issue, which is if I hit a special ability, boom, player animation event has no receiver. Are you missing a component? Not a very useful error. Look, even if you click on it, you get almost nothing. So I'm really grateful for Perceptual for helping us get to the bottom of that. So let's go and dig in and see how special abilities work again and see if we cannot fix it. So special abilities, ability behavior, anim, play ability animation. So, yep, that's cool. It'll be when we play the ability animation, almost certainly. And then we, the actual animation has not had its events stripped. So let's go and look in our code base for remove animation or animation event. In weapon config, we have a very simple method that says remove animation event and it does this. It removes the animation events. I think I'm just going to use that code, okay to copy and paste once, over in ability behavior, and before we play ability animation, which gets called from, could do with some refactoring here, but it's not too bad. Where do we play ability animation? Um, where are we calling that? Control F. We call it from elsewhere. We call it from the given class, we'll call it from, for instance, self-heal behavior, and we'll call it here in the child class. So what I think I want to do is the first step of playing animation, ability animation, is to clear those, or actually, to be honest, we could clear them on start, but I need to reacquaint myself with how all this works, because here we have attack animation as an animation click serialized field. So in ability behavior, do we have the same thing? Ability config, it's all the way through an ability config now. Ability animation. Now we have a start, it's about the config. I would say we do it here. No, not public, just void start. Let's get rid of this ability animation, these animation events here. We do have start on scriptable objects, I'm pretty sure. And we want to remove animation events. In fact, I don't need a method for it. And it's not called attack animation, but this should do it. It's called ability animation. Yes, we could centralize that code to do consider centralizing with uh, the stuff that is in weapon config.cs. So the most useful thing would be to, to put in this string here, remove animation events. It's not going to be stable if I do a rename. But I don't want to do it now because we've only uh, we've only done this once. We've only copied the code once. That should solve it, I think. Let's save all and play and see. Is that how you would have done it, perceptual? You do it in the getter. Yeah, that's cool. That's fine as well. Ugh. Did not work. Why did mine not work? So I, on start of ability config, am stripping my ability animation of events. Um, I would have thought that would then work. Uh, get ability animation. Yes, you're probably right. Let's just do it in the getter like you have. I think that is a better idea. Thank you. Easy. Move the code down. Could have taken the comment with it, actually. 
So you're doing something like that, right? Yes, because we can pick weapons, uh, we can pick up special abilities later, so the start may not catch it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, exactly, it doesn't, it's not even getting called. Quite simple. So there you go, in the getter, as Perceptual has done it, nice and easy. Yeah, bear in mind that with, with uh, messages, guys, really easy to kind of forget what class you're in here, so we're in a scriptable object. Um, if you type a message, if you go void start, you know, it may not get called. So um, if we come in here, remember that you can't use, by the way, uh, in non mono behaviors print, but you can use debug.log. So in the, if you go debug.log, I'm not starting, will that print or will that not? So debug.log works here, but do we have a start in a scriptable object? Let's go find out. Yes or no, what do you think? It does not print, right? The start message is not getting called. So um, if you don't believe debug, well, I mean, we know that debug.log works. So. Not surprising, because start gets called on monobehaviors, not on scriptable objects. Exactly perceptual. It gets called on all the monobehaviors in the game. That's the whole point of the start message that is almost certainly set up in Unity using the c -sharp reflection system uh, behind the scenes. That's how we did things in Terminal Hacker. All right, so we have solved uh, that issue, which was uh, there. Cool, we're making progress. Keep going. So it's, see the, the pattern to it, the cadence to it, it's a little bit slow, the progress, but, but also it's not. Right? Bear in mind, I'm only streaming or working on this a couple of hours a week, so um, it's, not, it's not too bad. Um, they still think enemy AI line 27 is not used, and I don't want that coming up all the time, so let's see if I can't get rid of that. Where's enemy AI? What am I, what am I missing? Scripts or enemies? A lot of code in this thing. Line... I do use state, and why is it telling me that enemy AI.state is assigned, but its value is never used? Because I set it to idle, they're saying whenever I use it, I, before I use it, I'm always assigning it to something else. But then if I don't initialize it, it's probably going to complain, and the default state for an enemy AI probably should be idle. I'm not sure there's an easy way out of this error. If I get rid of the initialization value, I'd be surprised if I don't get another complaint, but we shall see. I need water. I will go and get water in a minute. Seems to have stopped it, but it might be a first project open error. No, it's not. Okay, I'll take it. And I'll take note of that. Okay, um, we are doing rather well, oh, and rather slow. So, guys, you never told me what you wanted us to do next. Do I need to put a poll up for that, or shall I just crack into uh, any of it? We don't have any facility for inventory. Um, I want to do inventory next. Rick's like, oh, well, we should really finish quest. You know what he was doing? He was saying we need a reward for quest completion and that is one of the most important things to do. So on our quests here, in the superclass, we give ourselves an amount of coin for reward, and we said, well, if you, know, if you win, you get some coin. I think I'm gonna, um, and I think I got as far through as the player, actually. I think the player, somewhere in the player state, somewhere hopefully sensible, um, I think it was a private variable on the inventory for the moment, talks about how much coin the player has. Let's have a look in debug mode in the inspector. Oh, that was ugly for a minute. Yeah, coin there. So then the idea is that when I complete a quest, I get some coin. Maybe we should surface that so that it actually becomes play functionality. So which of these quests has got a coin as a reward? It's Escape the Pen, which is this dude's quest. So I get, I get that. Yeah, um, if I go look at the player and lock the inspector so I don't click off it and collapse down to the thing I'm interested in, which is inventory coin here, let's just escape the pen and I'm very confident that we will end up with 100 coin. Um, may as well surface that to the UI, I think. Um, and then, then at least it becomes part of gameplay features. So let's, let's do that. Pretty simple. Now, what do you guys think about polling? Having coin in here as an instance variable of the inventory and just polling that from the UI every frame in update. Do you think that's any, for any reason going to be fundamentally slower? I've got my view on this. I don't. And then, by the way, if anybody knows what these frustrum errors are when I switch to 2D view, That'd be cool. I don't really bother me because they only happen when I first switch to 2D view, but if anybody knows what's going on there. Uh, I've got a feeling it may be a Unity bug, uh, but if you know what they are, let me know. Anyway, we need something that tells us how much coin we have, I think, and let's just make a really simple UI element that does that. So quest list, a bit like quest list, let's duplicate it up. Let's just say coin, and then we can come in and add pretties to it, add a picture of a coin, etc. Um, I've locked, be careful here, I've locked the inspector with a little padlock, so don't go renaming the wrong things. So this is simply coin. It's got, um, now I'm in debug mode, so it's got a lot of stuff here, but that's okay. 
let's move the coin, make the coin smaller, move it up to the top right. Make sure you know what the anchors are. Whenever you put down a piece of UI, you want to make sure you're in the right mode and that you know where your, your anchors are because without that, you don't quite know how it's going to, uh, going, to, going to move around. I think that it doesn't work quite the same in debug mode with these things. It doesn't. You can't be in debug mode in the inspector and still expect to get your, your, your full anchor control, all right? Just as, a, just as an aside here. So let's, move, let's go here. Let's anchor to the uh, top right. Let's use their default thing, which is this guy here. That'll be fine, just so we make sure we see it. Let's make sure we put in coin of zero and right align and maybe middle align. It's easier to, uh, vertically, easier to reason about. And we're not gonna worry about it too much. Um, so yeah, I would make a coin update to call whenever it changes. Yeah, um, you could, you could do that. I wonder if it's actually any slower at the end of the day because somewhere in the engine, there will be a hot loop telling this text object what to render and what value to use to render. And I just wonder, I'm not seeing any evidence in the performance profile of it's any slower just to pop a script on here that says, hey, up, oh, we don't want journal, by the way, this is not the component we want. Uh, just pop a script on here that says, hey, go and update yourself from this class. So I, good morning, by the way, bone, bone fire drone. Um, so I don't know if it's actually any slower to do it, to do it that way round. It's... Yeah, it's, uh, we, we need to wait till we get into performance profiling. The easy way to do this is just to call this script. Uh, we need a script on here, right? Or we, or we don't, or we don't. So one decision is if, we, if we're going to do it through polling, so going from the dependencies from here back into uh, the inventory in this case, then we're going to need to put a script on this item. The other way around, but the good thing about that, by the way, is if you click on that item, you can see that, that, that it has some sort of... Um, that it has some behavior and you can see what it updates. If you do it the other way around and you drag a reference to the coin into say the inventory, um, well, which inventory instance would you drag it into? You'd have to go and find, you've got to find this thing somehow. So how would you perceptual link the two together in a way that's very clear to the designer what's driving it if you were to do it around the other way? I like being able to click here and say, oh, what does this do? What updates it? Have a script, even if it's, uh, you know, even if it's, um, well, what would we call it and where would we put it? We'd put it in, uh, probably in camera UI, ultimately, and just say um, coin display. And it's a really thin and simple script. And we then go and edit that in Visual Studio, probably. And we could very simply go and say, well, there is a dependency on characters. Uh, it's not Unity Engine, it's RPG. So we're making very clear that there's a, there's a dependency on characters here, like that. And then in start, no, yes, in this case, we are gonna cache a reference. So we're gonna keep ourselves a reference to the inventory. So we just say uh, inventory, uh, player inventory, just to be clear what it is. So this is a private, we don't need to say private, private. So inventory, player inventory, like so. And then we go find it. So we're gonna say the player inventory, there should only be one of these. Oh, is this true? Um, probably. Find object of type. Inventory. Yep, this is assuming, and I'll put it to do in assuming only player has this. Player inventory equals find object of type. Inventory, that's good. And then we can just have on this, on this player inventory a getter. Where's the player inventory? It will be in... Dialogue and quest for the moment, I think. Where did, we, where did we put that? Or did we put it in characters? Probably should be in characters. Should be in characters player. Uh, it is not. Where is the inventory script? Built, built it just yesterday, the other day. Let's go find it. Where are you in scripts inventory? Characters, scripts, oh, okay. Characters, scripts, inventory. New version of Java is very nice. Don't care right now, but it's very nice. Add coin, and then we could just go public uh, uh, int, yeah, int uh, get coin amount, and we could just return coin. Okay, so if we, if we do it this way, which is quite simple to do, we can come in and we can just say, uh, we need to also use the unity engine.ui namespace because that is uh, what we're doing here. So updating UI. 
I like being able to see what the dependencies are here. Uh, and we also better cache the, uh, the text box in question. We don't want to get it every single possible time. So what's it called? It's just a text box. So it's just text and it's just uh, coin text. And we can go and find that as a component. So coin text, there's so many ways of doing these things. So we can just get component here, get component of type text. There'll only be one on here. And then we can simply go uh, that the coin text dot text equals player inventory dot get coin amount boom dot two string may not be necessary let's see probably is yep all right with a method all right so perceptual is going to have something to say about this architecture i completely vibe with you if you don't like it i understand your objections and we'll talk about them in a second i haven't read your objections yet i'm just making sure that the coin amount actually updates and then we'll talk about the pros of doing it this way which is from a pure coding architecture point of view i've got some concerns but from a how the um, how easily Rick can dive in here now, see this object, uh, click on it, look at it and go, what does it do? Click on coin display and see that a script does exactly this and that it binds the player inventory to the coin text. From that point of view, it's very nice. And we've proved before in the performance profile at very little overhead. So let's have a little discussion. I actually really need water. So I'm going to read your, your, ch your, your um, comments whilst I'm going and getting a drink. I'm going to leave Unity playing you some sound, some game sound. Uh, don't mute the audio. Send a bit of Unity sound through. Cool, I'll be back in a sec and I shall read your comments on the way. Won't be long. Perceptual because it hasn't come on the chat on my phone because it wasn't on at the time. You've got to love streaming chat. If you can repaste your comment, it'd be awesome. Back with water, let's read the chat. Um, thank you, you may have reposted. Let's just open a few things up and discuss this way of doing it, which on the surface seems minging, but may maybe isn't. Uh, did you repost it? Yes, thanks, Perceptual. So I tend to keep all HUD elements in one class with an update method for each element that can be called when any of them changes. As a personal preference, I don't like to poll for anything but user input because it's unpredictable from the code, whereas something like HUD elements, the code knows exactly when it happens. Yeah. 
but how about how easy this project is to keep track of between two people and what exactly is updating this? How do we know what's updating this in your model perceptual? Um, since we're accessing the imagery with a coin display either way, might not make an event. You could make an event, but how long does, do events take? To, have you ever had a game where you like do something simple like complete a quest or pick up some coin and there's a slight stuttering and a slight drop in frame rate? Um, that could be because things like events are being triggered off that take a long time to process and it's much harder to debug than a constant overhead of, of update which we can test in the performance profiler. It's actually super negligible. I would say give, things the, give the performance optimization system in Unity the benefit of the doubt and only worry about performance when you've proven that there's a reason. You've got to be careful about death by a thousand pinpricks which is where you have loads of things running update loops each of which um, don't look like they're taking much time, but which in aggregate actually slow things down. So you do need to be aware of that. Um, so thanks for repeating that perceptual. I could, didn't read it when I was out because I got hijacked by three people all saying Ben Daddy at the same time, which was fun. Hey, Grass, have a good to see you. Um, yeah, so I'd like to hear a bit more about that, but fundamentally, I'm not worried about it for now. We will worry about performance later. For the moment, my priority is communicating to Rick in a way that doesn't require any communication. He can come here now, he can click on coin display, can see exactly what it does. So that to me overweighs any performance disadvantages we may have. But I'm super happy to switch the architecture around. Super easy to do, right? All right, the only risk of this type of approach is that you start to create a paradigm where there's death by a thousand pinpricks, but the performance overhead of this update is so low it doesn't, low, it doesn't even show up on the performance profiler, so I'm not concerned about it for now. All right, so we've done that. What were we trying to do? What, are, what is our current goal? Oh, I don't know. Um, oh, okay, so show coin display to gamer. Gamer, user, gamer, gamer. Oh, yeah, we're a gamer more than a user. Gamer, it looks weird, that spelling. Just gonna check it updates. It will. Our belt and braces. Well, met friend, um, I say, approach. you're on the right path to the village. Well, met friend, I say, you're on the right path to the village. There's our coin. Okay, cool. So that's surfacing. So we have basic, basic coin functionality in there. I think we need to think about other quest types that require inventory personally. And as Rick's not here to complain about that, I think that's what the direction I'm going to go in is the types of quests like gather or... Um, what was the other thing? Jan gave me a load of quest types and I put them somewhere very sensible, which would have been in uh, the root of quest or in the root of quest completion. Gather and deliver. Um, gather just before inventory. Why did we say we would do that just before inventory? That seems like the right thing to do next. We kind of feel like we are just before inventory. Death by a thousand pinpricks. Yeah, but you only get death by a thousand pinpricks if you've got a thousand pins, right? So unless you're doing something literally a thousand times, um, I wouldn't worry about it. And you can detect death by a thousand pinpricks with a sufficiently sensitive instrument, that, uh, profiling instrument that can see how much time it actually is taking. And then you can do an estimate as to how many classes are doing that and whether it really is slowing things down. So, Terra Vice. Hey, Terra Vice, good to see you, old chap. So because we were going to hack inventory, it's interesting. I'm tr I've got it on low stream latency, but I speak so fast that however quickly you say something, I'm, we're completely out of sync by the time uh, by the time it comes through. So just qualify that a bit, by the way, and that would be awesome. By the way, if anybody wants to dive in on Zoom uh, while we're doing this and talk, it's not going to be a code review. It's not going to be any of those things that only tier three people get. But if you want to dive in on Zoom and talk, uh, actually, let's open this only up to tier two, uh, three subscribers, which, of which Terravice is one. Oh, OK. Why we put just before inventory, uh, if you want to dive in specifically, I guess I'm saying, um, then you'd be welcome to dive in on Zoom. Let me know if you'd like to, and you can chat with us while we do this. So there's a second voice in the stream. Great stream, I'll watch the rest later. Need to get back to the course, reformatting code before I've ever written. It is fun, but a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, before you've even written. Anyway, thanks for joining us. It's awesome that you did. How long has this stream been going? One till 2.40, an hour and 40 minutes, quite long. Um, and I'm now disastrously hungry. How long have I got? I've got till 4 p.m., so that's another hour and 20. Okay. <laughs> Daughter's trying to work out she can get some water into the pond for the newts. The pond level is dropping rapidly and she doesn't want the newts to die, which is quite sweet. So she's a uh, She's discussing with people what we need to do in order to get water into the pond, which is a long way down the car. So, Terravice, because we were going to hack inventory and set it up after we were able to obtain the items. Yeah, 
I remember. And we kind of have started hacking inventory, right? We've got this class that does oh, almost nothing. So yeah, let's have something else we can go and get. So let's have that. Let's start to abstract out the concept that there's something in the world which is of type inventory. Does that make sense? That's of type potential inventory. And then we go and pick that thing up and that it may or may not come. I'm wondering if this existing inventory class will do it. It's not, it wouldn't be in then characters namespace. That would no longer make sense. It'd be quite interesting to rename space it. But that a given piece of inventory has fundamentally some coin value. That kind of makes sense. Anything has value, right? I don't know if eBay, oh, excuse me, yawning now. <laughs> My body's trying everything to get me to eat. Um, I don't know if, uh, if they had eBay in this, in this medieval world, but in the real world, it, practically everything has some value. So the concept that in inventory has um, some low, uh, everything has some coin value. It could even be called coin, coin value here. Let's do the rename, coin value. Love C sharp, love the way we can rename like that safely then anything could be tagged as having inventory. So I think I'm gonna go down that road, which is that inventory exists, no, you know what, where this is not gonna work? If we do a find of inventory, we get, we're realizing that this class is not well named if we're not careful. Because we do things like, we just did a find object of type inventory and said, and we assumed it was only the player that has inventory. So we need to be careful about this inventory name. If we're gonna extend this to being the the component that goes on an object in the world, like a whatever, it could be anything, it could be a sheet, whatever's got some value, um, then we need to be careful about our naming. So it's the API of inventory. So the state of something that's a piece of inventory, it has value. Can you add coin to a, to, a, to a thing out in the world? Probably not. So I think we're going to end up with an inventory item class and like a player inventory class, I think. Ketosis allows for tea and coffee while fasting. The biggest enemy of ketosis is carbohydrates. So I hope you drink tea straight and your coffee black. I do, Terravice, absolutely drink my tea straight and my coffee black. If I don't touch any, any calories, it's, it's water or black coffee and only one or two of those. I've had two coffees today. I don't plan on having any more. Oops, and if I drink tea, I have a drinking problem. The problem is I miss my mouth. And if I drink tea, it has nothing in it. So I'm going to rename this player inventory before we're tempted to make another mistake with that again. Um, which means that my to-do in the, wherever I just found this thing, coin display, uh, there will only be one player. So I can get rid of that concern. This thing now becomes called player inventory. So that's, that's better. Uh, and arguably could be moved into the player, um, probably should be moved into the player folder, which is fine. Uh, is it okay in Unity? Does it mind you moving it over in Visual Studio? I don't think it does. Let's just double check. Generally, you want to move assets in the Unity asset browser, but I think that it will, uh, it may not actually like that. It's not, this is, this is a false error. This is not the frustrum error that's causing this not to run. I don't think. What is the real error here? This is the real net error. Uh, type on name says inventory could not be found in quest completion 26. Why has that come about? Interesting. What are you talking about? Is it because I hadn't saved the file? Probably. Maybe I didn't do a save all. You know, I always tell you to do a save all whenever you do a rename. I think I just didn't follow my own advice there. Yeah, you should be changing everything in. Now, reference coin display. Why am I getting a null reference in my coin display? A, not set to an instance of an object. Where's this coming from? Is this repeating? Yes. Reference script on player is, back, is missing. Yeah, so don't do what I just did. Uh, luckily, we committed just two seconds ago, but don't go and move your. Um, your class in Visual Studio like that is going to cause problems. So what, it's pretty easy just to stash here. In fact, I could just hit the stash button, go back and get back working again. But there's a little lesson. I have some other aside. Oh, is there a new, new something that the version control won't let me stash? No, it's all good. Just play, make sure we work. Absolutely, you should change in Unity. Whenever you move assets around, you should do it in Unity. So let's go back, let's go and sort out our, um, let's do that first actually. So where we have a uh, characters scripts inventory, 
should be in the, I think it should be in the player folder. So moving it in Unity note, and that won't break anything. And now I'm going to rename it over in Unity. This is the proper way to move and rename. Player inventory. Go copy that name. Then go to Visual Studio. Go find it in Visual Studio, which will track the movement. Into here, player inventory. Open the class. Rename the class. Player inventory. Copy and paste is better in this instance. And then save all. All right, and that's the way to simultaneously rename and move a script in Unity. If you want to clip that, if it's useful to anybody, then go ahead. All right, cool. So I've renamed it because I don't want to try and use it for the wrong thing. This is just the player inventory. I think that I'm going to make a inventory item uh, class and then see how those two stack up against each other as we go and whether we centralize and we don't, we use inheritance, whatever we do. Let's just start the behavior. What I want in the world is a something that has some value. So let's go and get a gather quest. I'm going to go and find something in the world and I want a quest completion criteria that lets me lets me um, pick something up. Could be a weapon actually, couldn't it? Why don't we have a quest completion to go get a weapon? Where are my weapons? We had them all laid out somewhere a bit crazy. I'll go and get myself near the weapons. In fact, I'll even move the NPC that gives us quests or create a new one. Um, I'm just trying to remember this world a bit. I'm purposely scrolling around rather than trying to find the weapons any other how, because I want to reacquaint myself a little bit with the world and where everything was. Um, remember where we left the weapons. Really remember the world that well. Agent Unknown, thank you very much for subscribing with Twitch Prime while you watch us put this, this stuff together. So, yep, don't remember where it is. Let's go and see how well laid out it is. Rick has done it by zones. Uh, is there an axe? Is there, there a bunch of axes? Where are these? Path, chopping, stumps and logs, environments, item axe, weapon, environment, zone 2 library, pickaxe. Yeah, but this is, these are kind of, this is a little asset playground that Rick's got off to the side. I need to just go and find anything for us to pick up, preferably something that already has the pickup mechanic on it so that we're dealing with purely, this is a weapon, it can already be picked up. I'm just going to put a weapon prefab down right next to the player and reacquaint myself with that. Try not to load too much context at once here in my head, so trying to um, keep it as simple as possible, but dropping a weapon prefab in here is gonna be fine, so let's do that. So we have weapon, we have a, it doesn't really matter what weapon I go for, um, to be honest. We go for a melee weapon of some sort, bastard swords, eh? All right, well, let's drop a bastard sword, what a name, um, into the world. Thanks for the naming, Rick really am having a general issue with dragging and dropping in here. And it hasn't really caused me an issue up to now, but the fact I can't drag and drop... Oh, I can now. There you go. Bastard sword grip. Right. Where are my weapons? Where are my prefabbed weapons? There you go. There's a fully finished prefab weapon. Let's just go get this sword in the world. If this drag and drop continues not to work, I'm going to just update Unity. Come on. <laughs> what is going on there? Click on it, you hold the mouse button down, you drag, and it ignores me. You sod. I'm going to update Unity. I'm fed up with it now. Previously, it was, it was basically fine, but, but now it's not. Uh, official releases. We're on 2018.02b. Um, OK, 02f. Let's go for that. Uh, documentation, yeah, I think so. Let's just go with that standard stuff. All right, I'm going to install a new version of Unity. I'm going to chat to you guys for a second. So how do we do that? Let's expand out my face a bit because you don't want to watch Unity downloading. Expand out the chat a bit. Oh, that's really expanded out. Oh, hold on, there's probably another way of doing this, uh, which is... Ah, it doesn't matter. Messy, it'll do, it's fine. Let's catch up on the chat and see how we're doing. Well, I have a drink as well. Where are we? What was the truth, Agent Unknown? What was Terra Vice's truth? Terra Vice said something true? Huh. I never know. Code of 100, welcome. It seems like you'd be able to get added value of some inventory items. No. Uh, zoom. No, you should be able, a, a code of 100, you should be able to, if you're in a country that supports linking your Amazon Prime to Twitch, you should be able to do what Agent Unknown has just done and subscribe to Twitch Prime. Um, yeah, we'll get into the details of whether we can change coin value, etc. later. I think what I want to do next, once this new version of Unity is downloaded, is to simply allow um, 
say for instance, picking up of a weapon where there's already a pickup mechanic, to have, um, to, to say to that weapon, you also are an, um, an inventory item and that you have some coin value and that potentially you also complete a quest. And then if we can tie all that together, it'd be pretty cool. So you speak to someone, they say, hey, go find the, the sword of death or whatever. Um, and you go and get the sword of death. And while you've got the sword of death, it's got some coin value, but it also maybe completes a quest. So that's kind of where I'm going with this in the immediate, in the immediate future here. Yeah? So thanks, Brian, for trying to help there. Uh, allowed Prime users to subscribe. So thanks for helping people with the Amazon Prime subscriptions. That's very cool. The, the U, Udemy, this is the RPG course on Udemy. So basically, everybody who's watching this has some knowledge of that Unity RPG course. And uh, yeah, Squirrel. Uh, what's the Squirrel, Terravice? Is that the updating of Unity? It is a Squirrel, but if I can't even drag a weapon into the world, it's vaguely necessary. Um, do we care about the coin value unless we're selling it, Bryant? Um, no, not particularly. Uh, what I was first question was, we've already got something called inventory. Uh, it's very tempting to use that for inventory, right? So I needed to look at that class and say, well, what is it? Well, really, it's designed for player inventory. So let's call it player inventory and start a new thing called inventory item. And then write those two classes separately to do the things that they're dedicated to do. And then later decide, are those two actually the same thing or related to each other and then discover that relationship and build upon it rather than uh, forcing it. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of what we're doing. Okay, random question, Agent Unknown. What's your preferred approach for projecting a target area template onto the ground for casting an AOE spell? Uh, never mind if you can't answer at the moment. I can answer at the moment. Uh, didn't we do this recently? I'm trying to think what we came out with as a preferred method for that. No, I don't remember, to be frank with you right now. Um, if you throw out a few different methods that you've researched, I will help you choose between them rather than taking it greenfield and squirreling. That's okay. Shouldn't coins be an inventory item? Um, possibly. We'll see how that all comes together in a bit. Uh, let's, let's just now get to the point where we have the concept of an inventory item that we turn one of the swords, one of the weapons that's in the world into. We walk into the sword. It becomes in our inventory and equipped. Now that's interesting, we need to think about that because we can already pick up weapons. If you look at the game, can we look at the game? Yeah, because we've still got a version of Unity that works available. Let's, let's look at the game and just think about this from a, from a UI point of view as well as just a uh, structure point of view. Yeah, that's fine, Agent Unknown. Bear in mind also, if you upgrade to Tier 3 subscription, uh, then you can dive on our next Meet the Mentors review and we can help you out with it live on there. And, help, and then we're helping everybody else at the same time. So the great thing about tier three, I mean, we've always thought, how can we help people one-on-one -on -one individually? We can't afford to do that because the opportunity cost of what we can be doing on Udemy and, and, and elsewhere. So what we've done is we said, well, if you're willing to be helped publicly, then you're generating content for us. Uh, and therefore we can get to a win-win where we help you publicly like we've been doing with Terravice and um, then we get to generate content. So therefore you access one-to-one -one help with us at a much more sensible price than it would otherwise be. We don't just don't do any time for money work, full stop. So anyway, I'm going to go back to the previous uh, screen layout now um, and not bother. I'll, I'll do the Unity upgrade when it's finished downloading because I, I need the solution open to have a look at a few things. So let's... Make me go small. Is it really ropey the way I'm doing this in the streams with like quick time and all that? Or is it okay? It gives me a lot of flexibility. I don't have to mess around with pre-made scenes and stuff. I guess it works, but I just, uh, it's kind of kind of honest and transparent. So what I'm saying, uh, by the way, is when we look at the game, we've already got this thing here. Now this is abilities and weapons, right? Part of this UI at the bottom here is the special abilities, which we don't really consider to be inventory. It's all a bit kind of weird and non-physical and magical, but that's okay. We can live with that. Just get VLQ working so I can highlight a few things. So we already have special abilities over here. Then over here, we've got the fact that we have a given sword is our primary weapon. And I think that the decision at the moment is that we only have one weapon, as in primary left click attack, attack weapon equipped at any one time. And we haven't yet got any concept of bringing up a dialogue box. And you know, in that dialogue box as a club, this is gonna be my club with its spikes sticking out of it like this. This looks dodgy. Um, and the ability to click on that and then put that down as your primary weapon. We haven't got that yet. So as a first prototype towards this, um, Maybe I don't do a weapon as the pickup because it creates a lot of extra side threads to think about. Maybe the, the, the first gather quest 
should be to pick up something that isn't a weapon. That would probably, uh, probably make sense. That sword in the hotbar represents power attack. Yeah, exactly. It's your left click power, it's your left click power attack. Um, no, hold on. Is it? What is it? What, what does the sword? I've completely forgotten. Give me a sec. Let me reacquaint myself. Completely forgotten why we put that sword there. I know it represents power attack, but... Uh, yeah, you've got... From what I remember, the left click, and it's not running right now for whatever reason, the left click does a, an attack with a sword that's equipped, and then the right click does a power attack with a sword, and then one and two do, uh, do these special abilities that are listed here. I don't want to conflute this stuff together right now. I just, we're just trying to do gather quests. Let's not get too squirreled on that. So um, I'm going to pick up something else that isn't a weapon to start with, and then we'll resolve the issues to what happens if you pick up a weapon. Does it become immediately equipped? Does it go in your inventory and you can equip it? Is this in or out of scope of this game? It gets a lot more complicated. If I pick up something that isn't a weapon, it makes life a lot easier. Right? So the screen could come later, but you can have a coin counter that references the coins in inventory. Not a big deal if it lags a bit. Doubt anyone would notice. We do have a coin counter. It's at the top right here. I don't know if you missed it, Brian, but we, uh, we have just made a coin counter there. It's where we had the whole discussion about should it be polling in update, and that feels dirty, but actually the reality is it's probably fine. Um, yeah, no worries. You're welcome to miss things. Well, look, the tip jar. Look at this. It's like, I really feel like a busker. Is this modern busking? Is this what this is? Is this like, here's my stuff. Come and, come and help us out. Anyways, this version of Unity downloaded because I really want a more stable version. I'm having a lot of problems with this one. Hey, it has. Let's upgrade. So then my commit just becomes upgrading the version. What are the other changes here? I think they're minor. Yeah, it's just a rename. I'll do them separately, two separate clips. Uh, so inventory to player inventory. Rename. Just commit that, boom. And then we'll upgrade the version, which we do like this, I believe these days. Projects, new model, now. Um, that. Is you switch the version. I like this new Unity Hub. What do you guys think of the new Unity Hub? The idea that you can have multiple versions of Unity, uh, sorry, multiple projects, each of which is tied to a different version of Unity. Is that, is that rock or is that not rock? Where's the label? There's no label. Oh yeah, Rick will we'll put in a coin label and make it pretty. Yeah. Non-matching editor, that's what we want. That's the point. In fact, I might as well put a pre-commit message, upgrade Unity version. Don't need to say what the upgrade is. Unity now at last actually tells us what the version is inside its text files. It didn't used to, by the way. There was a point at which you could not tell what a previous Unity version was. I had a lot of trouble at one point uh, trying to go back and edit the Unity course, the 2D, the original 2D Unity course, and you could not tell what version the, the, it was created in. But now, anyway, it's in a project version.txt file in plain text, which is yay for Unity, progress. Yeah, it is a lot better than messing around with folders. Think about the player as a container, contains an inventory, inventory is a container that contains other world objects. Uh, yes, that's a good mental model. Mel Cause at 98, thank you for that, that is true. Let's just see how we get on. So now it's doing a full asset re-import, unfortunately. So back in, you know when we were talking earlier in a couple of commits back, we were saying um, clear warnings, and we talked about three different types of warnings on my actual commit message, which is here. You've got the play-to-play -play warnings, warnings that the, the checks that are done by Unity every time you get play. Then you've got the first time you open the project warnings, and then you've got the after you've deleted the library folder type warnings, after a clean checkout. Um, doing this update is, of the Unity version is another time that we're automatically going to end up having to do the after clean warning. We're going to get all the after clean checks done. So you don't really need to go through this clear warnings process. So on a play to play basis, yes, you should be clearing your warnings. So that's natural. Every time you play, you clear your warnings. You're going to close and reopen the project at some point. It's healthy to do that probably once a day. So close Unity and reopen it the next day. And then that's when you should be clearing your first open warnings. And then the after clean warnings, I would probably be cleaning each time you upgrade Unity. Just update every time there's a point release and do that. So there's nothing special to do, right? So with reference to the previous advice, that, that, that was about awareness. Now the advice is just, just do it when it comes up, basically. Just clear warnings when you see them. Upgrade Unity regularly, but with a version control protecting you. Um, close Unity daily, clear them when you see them, upgrade now and then, you're good to go. So that's, that's pretty simple. Now we've got to wait for this asset import. I might need to get a faster machine just so that you guys don't sit around. I'm really looking for a reason to buy a Mac Pro. It's just vicious, vicious cost. 
laptop. I could just get a faster laptop. I'm several generations behind. Go, go back to a laptop. Just like the all-in-one. You know, it's cool. Okay, uh, because sometimes it streams and I'm uninstalling old versions. Okay, rework movement to my liking. Now back to the course because I'm super behind. All right, good luck. Um, if you want to share Svetlaka92, uh, a little animated GIF or a little short video of the movement, how it is on your project, we'd love to see it. Uh, it's much more interesting for me to see your projects. My job is not to make our project, but is to facilitate you guys in making your projects. So please do share. I would love to see that, by the way. Here comes Unity. I keep getting tempted to end streams, but you guys are convinced I shouldn't, as long as you're clipping. Are you clipping? People clipping? Anybody clipping? Hopefully you're clipping. All right. A load of errors. I'm not going to check them because we've specifically just gone through the, you know, after, after clearing the library warnings. But normally you would check all your warnings. Now, the reason I did the upgrade was because I couldn't drag the weapon in. Let's see if that whole upgrade process was worth it. I Can I drag a weapon in? Even if I decide now not to drag a weapon in for, for reasons discussed, the point is that was my intention, right? So I, I'm trying to keep track of the branches and the thoughts and keep bringing yourself back to the trunk of the tree. You keep branching off and branching off the branch. They're the squirrels. It's fine. It's all discovery and progress, but remember the direction. Remember where the sunlight is. Can I now drag a sword into the world? Yes, straight away, boom. So that's nice, yeah? Now, I'm actually not gonna drag the sword into the world because during the process, I decided my intention had changed and this is too complicated. So just see the mental separation. I upgraded Unity because I couldn't drag. Did it fix it? Yes, cool, good news, feel good, warm, fluffies. Do I want a sword as a gather, first gather quest? No, raises too many complications. Let's put something else in here as a gather quest. What should we put? Something conspicuously not, um, not you know, not, part of the game. Oh, I like that. I like, it's really good that Rick has set the ambient light as not white because that has come in straight away as slightly more interesting colored. So I like that. And the first gather quest is going to be this beautiful cube here, right? So we're going to give ourselves uh, probably a new NPC and we're going to show you guys how to create new quests. And this NPC is going to, um, it's going to have a different conversation. Yeah, why not make a quick different conversation? So we go to dialogues and quests. We're going to make a new conversation. And this is going to, he's going to be cool. I'm going to call him Cube Dude just for fun. Cube Dude. So this is the Cube Dude conversation. The opening gambit is, here, uh, find me a cube. And the player's response is going to be, OK. So that's cool. So now the Cube Dude here can have the, and I might even made a drag here, which I couldn't do before. The conversation is Cube Dude. Ah, dragging's fixed. That's nice. Now, the quest. So he has a conversation. Yes, he has a quest. It's optional, but let's create a quest. How do we do that? Well, we just make a child object. It's going to go get the cube. So this is our first get the cube. I'm going to put escort in brackets just to uh, help make it easy to find. How do you make a quest a quest? Very simple. You add the quest script. Is it available? Yeah, why not? Is there any reward coin? No, it doesn't need to be. Uh, did I rename that object? No, I didn't. I went out the box wrong. So let's go and say get the cube or escort, uh, gather, gather, it's not escort, it's gather, gather the cube. So now, anyway, the name is wrong, I fixed it, I spotted it. Here's Johnny, I'll look at your video in just a sec. So we have a script, we have a quest, so let's then say that this guy's quest he grants is gather the cube. Um, he does not have escort as well, so remove that. He just issues us a gather quest. Okay, let's go and see what happens when we go and speak to him. We're, we're kind of part of the way there. Thanks Terra Vice, by the way, for the here's Johnny clip. Clip that. Gather the cube. Okay, here, find me a cube. You reply, okay, I walk along, and obviously the cube gathering isn't going to work right now. Why? Well, because it's just a cube, isn't it? So, um, yes, there will keel block be a follow-on course to the Udemy, on, the, on Udemy, there will be another course. It will maybe a slightly different structure, because by the time you've done the first course, you're going to want content at a different pace and a different style, I think. Uh, but this is part two, what we're doing right now. We're prototyping part two. I'm working out how part two is going to be. The current thought is I'm actually going to finish prototyping part two and then either, either me or Rick and Sam. So it's definitely going to involve, involve Rick, the, the production of part two. On one extreme, it could be Rick only once I've worked out the prototype. On the other extreme, it would be me and Rick. In the middle, it would be Rick and Sam. But for now, we're working out what, how part two is done. We don't want you on the course to uh, go down all of these little kind of blind alleys. You know, we may entirely change still the structure of how quests are done, for example. And if we do that, then we don't want to take you down that blind alley on the course. So, gather cube. I'm going to put the gather cube in the environment at the bottom of the meadows. I think just dropping it onto meadows will do that. 
And what we're showing you here is the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. But hopefully by watching these streams, you're learning, I'm just a flow of consciousness. I'm telling you everything I'm thinking and you're learning the stuff that's behind the stuff. So even though we do a good job of telling you why, this is the, the why behind the why behind the why. You know, this is the every single step. So this will complement the, uh, the Udemy course. The Udemy course will link off to the streams. Um, or at least a YouTube version of the streams. I'm keep keeping here every single stream in as a branch on the GitHub repo. Here's a link to the GitHub repo for you. Um, boom, there you go. Um, I'm keeping these so that I can reference from Udemy the, the relevant streams later. So it'll be like, here's the Udemy fast track, boom, boom, boom. Here's a very shallow why we're doing things. It's just what we're doing and challenging you to do it. And if you want the full stream of consciousness, how we got there, go see it. Go, go see the stream retros retrospect retrospectively. So if what you see on Udemy is enough for you and satiates your desire to know why, just crack on with it. If you want to know more, go see the video on demand or what will by then be a YouTube video. So gather the cube. Now the cube itself is going to need to, it's going to need a new script type on it. So this is where we create a new script type. We go and make a C sharp script in here. It's called gather. It's all coming together. Even You see, there's not really, by the way, if any of you have got a fear that we're going down a dead end, there's not really such thing as a dead end. We may have to change some stuff, but when we make that change, we'll have learnt a load of new things. So there's not really a dead end. If you're going, if you're going exploring, then the very job of exploring is making you a better explorer, even if you take a long time to get to the destination. There are no dead ends. There's just progress. So don't worry about dead ends. I don't. At the end of the day, we always get you there, don't we? So don't worry about it. It's all good. So the first thing about a gather I think, uh, class is it inherits from what? From You tell me, you guys who know the project, what class do we inherit from? It's on my screen. Uh, of the things that I'm highlighting, what class does should this gather quest? I'm not going to give you the other word. Um, what should it inherit from? Just as a quick question, make sure you guys are paying attention. So this is, this is a piece of behavior code that tells us how we complete a gather quest. It's not a mono behavior directly. Ugh. Man, I'm going to eat a lot when it gets to 4 or 5 p.m. A lot. And it doesn't matter because I haven't eaten anything since yesterday evening, so I can eat as much as I want. Anyway, I'm sure you guys know what class we're going to inherit from. I'm sure you've just tuned out a little bit. How many viewers do we have? 40. That's not too bad. Anyway, it's quest completion because the quest completion class is the, is the parent class that tells us what complex we can, all this stuff. Those words were starting to come out completely wrong there. So let's look for gather. Let's inherit from quest completion. What am I doing? Why can I not inherit from quest completion? Okay, I know why I can't inherit from quest completion. Do you guys know why I can't inherit from quest completion? Why can I not even find quest completion here? Why does it not exist when it's sitting right there? Ah, full marks to that man. Do we namespace or do we use using? We're going to namespace because we are writing code into the rpg.quests namespace. Awesome. Namespaces are fun, aren't they? It's our next layer of organization namespaces. It's, it's the thing that allows us to specify our interdependencies. So now this will come up, quest completion. Boom. Get rid of these silly methods, bless them. And actually at the moment, there is no kind of completion criteria on a gather. We can get somewhere down the line by just, um, oh, you know what? Uh, sorry, I've just squirreled a little bit. This is also, and I don't really want to do two things at once, but it's also a collision criteria. There's two things going on here. We are going to collide with the cube and we are going to then put it in our inventory, but I'm not going to reuse collision at the moment because it's only the first time and we're not sure we're doing exactly the same thing. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the on trigger enter into gather and be okay with it because it's my first copy. You could say first copy from collision.cs if you want to. First copy is fine. Okay. Later we might want to say that actually a gather quest is a collision quest completion criteria plus something about you know an add to inventory or something but we don't know yet we haven't done it let's let's carry on basically so gather if i was to just bang into something and that is completing the quest it's not a gather quest is it because it's just a collision quest 
You see the similarity between gather and collision here. Are we saying that gather means I have to go get something and come back somewhere? What do we really mean by a gather quest? Because we've already got gather in that you just collide with something. We could gather that cube by just touching it. But we've also, the cube itself has got to be responsible for kind of getting into your inventory. So do you want the quest to complete on gather? What about bring this to be quest? Or to me quest, I think you mean Brian. Exactly. So this is, this is exactly what we're talking about here. It's about the, the, the similarities and differences between a, a collision quest, which I think that is a, at the moment is just a straight, I'm hitting a trigger collider. I'm just hitting a trigger collider. And a gather, which feels like it's go get the thing, but is it a go get the thing and bring back or just go get the thing and get it into your inventory? I think bringing back is a pain in the butt for a player. If you're over the other side of the map and you've got to bring it back, yeah. By default, uh, gather is just collecting, delivery is taking it somewhere. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's just collecting. So what's happening in gather is that the, the, the gather quest completion needs to detect a collision needs to take the object out of the world. So let's just put this in comments. So we, maybe we complete the quest. Yeah, we do. But we take object out of world. And we're going to put object in inventory. And then we complete the quest, right? So that's what we're trying to do now. We can take the object out of the world very easily. We can, in the very crudest form, just say other dot game object dot destroy. Now, you, there isn't a dot destroy anymore. So I think what we need to do is we need to be, I think we should put an intermediate variable var, a thing we hit. Now, does this even make sense? Where's this script going? It's gather on, what's it on? Is it on the cube? Um, slightly losing track. Yeah, gather's going to be on the cube. So let's put gather on the cube. And it's a gather completion criteria. Which quest is it going to complete? Uh, the gather the cube quest. Uh, loving having this drag and drop working. So from the context of being on this cube, what are we going to what are we going to do? Well, we are going to kill ourselves. So we don't need to do anything complicated. We can just destroy and game object. Right, so let's just try this and complete the quest. And then we need to put it in the inventory. Skibbity bippity, skibbity bippity. So what happens if I touch the cube? Firstly, by the way, if I touch the cube, it shouldn't disappear unless the quest is active. It's not, but I'm not sure that's for the reasons I think it is. That's because we don't have a trigger on it. Um, so there's quite a lot of things coming off this. I might need to commit in a minute just to make sure we're not too far run out. If I touch that, it's going. It shouldn't go. Why would the cube go when I touch it and the quest is not um, even activated? If I go and look at gather the cube quest, it's available, but it's not started. So now we need to say, well, if I hit it and, so we need to say if the quest is started, yeah? So we can do that. That's quite cool. This inherits from quest completion. Quest completion knows what the quest to complete is. So we can simply say if quest to complete dot status, is it status, quest state, it's quest state, equals equals quest state dot started, if the quest is started, then we, and you see how that's gonna change the behavior? Uh, then we do this stuff, boom. Are we too indented here? Eh, we're a little indented, it's okay, we can, so we don't need to comment that, destroying the object. Put the object in inventory, yeah, that's even a to-do, and complete the quest. Okay, now let's go and check that, that it works in both cases. One case is that I go click on the cube, I go to the cube, and um, yeah, game object is trigger equals true. What TerraVice is saying here is that because I've added a gather, um, there's, there's lots of things we should be doing here, right? The gather, fundamentally, a gather, um, com a gather quest completion script should have a trigger box collider on it. So really, we ought to be going a require, there's lots of ways to do this, but we could be going require component, you know, type of, and then, um, but then it's difficult because we need to uh, type of collider. It's okay, 
Um, it's not necessarily going to add the right type of collider, but that's okay. It, it, needs, it needs a component of type collider, that's good. And then the other thing I think what you're saying is that we ought to be, uh, and we are, are we coming from a mono behavior here ultimately? Let's go up a level. Gather comes from quest completion, which comes from mono behavior. Yeah, I think what you're saying is on probably, I would do this on awake. I think what you're saying is that we go game object dot is trigger, and you can't do dot is trigger. Um, you have to go and get the uh, collider component and do that. So game object or get component um, of type tr uh, collider. And you could actually set this to trigger equals true. You could do that. So what you're saying here, Terra Vice, is that if even if I hadn't clicked to trigger, um, that it sets it to a trigger. I don't like it, by the way, because if you're going to have UI, I mean, it's going to work, right? Boom, it's a trigger and it, and it works. And I walk into this thing and it does nothing because the quest isn't active. In fact, it shouldn't even be a trigger. You see, this is a design decision. And if the designer, this is perfectly panning out, if the designer unclicks tick to trigger, it should stay unticked. The code shouldn't come and do it. So either instantiate, add the component box collider yourself and configure it in code or don't. I wouldn't go halfway like this. Right? Does that make sense? Don't like add the component in the inspector, which is all we're doing here by putting it in the inspector. And by the way, that's what this thing does. Don't add it in the inspector and then go and modify it in the, some of the details of it in code. Because now if as a designer, I want to say, no, no, this isn't a trigger. I don't want to run through it. And then I run the game and I'm not watching the inspector carefully. And then I run through it. It's like, well, what the hell's doing this? And you know, this, that's, that's, that's weird. All right. Um, so do we want them, it doesn't matter, it's going to disappear. It may as well actually be, if the default for this box collider is that it's not a trigger, it may as well not be a trigger, right? So we do need a type of collider, it doesn't need to be a trigger. Um, we don't need to use on trigger enter, we could use on collision enter. Any of you guys singing, you must, thou shalt copy and paste messages, Ho hopefully you are. Um, anyway, I didn't. Um, and then let's see what happens here. If the quest is not active, should the quest item even exist? Good question. That is a designer choice. It could be invisible. Um, it could just be invisible, couldn't it? It could be not active. Why don't we do that for a bit of fun? Um, oh, on update? Ugh, that's a bit. I'm going to do it on update just to annoy you guys. Um, and then we'll go and look and see how, how much it actually uses performance wise. So I'm going to say that if. Uh, quest to complete dot quest data. Let's just copy this. Doesn't equal quest date started. Then game object dot is active. Oh, is it game object dot is active? Um, is active and enabled equals false. So you're saying something like that. Uh, quest to complete. What's wrong uh, if? Quest to complete, oh, I just double pasted something, haven't I? It's set active. So we could do something like this um, to do measure performance. Game object dot set active, what's wrong with that is because it's, uh, oh. Wrong way round, how silly, obviously getting tired. So let's have a look, the cube's there, we run the game, the quest is inactive, thanks perceptual. Shouldn't exist, should, uh, but should it exist in memory at all until the quest is started? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's a design conversation now, right? We wanna know where this thing's gonna be here. So it's in memory, does it matter? Is it taking up a lot of memory? Maybe, depends how big it is. So good point, a good consideration, right? Um, the other thing is to, you know, uh, should this object be in memory prior to quest becoming active? Don't know, if it's not, then it's harder to see in the inspector. If it is, it's taking up more memory. Pros and cons, no rights and wrongs. Well, that almost rhymes. Pros and cons, no rights and wrongs. Anyway, let's get this puppy finished. Look, it's not there, it doesn't exist. Go talk to this guy. Uh, find me a cube, you reply okay, and the cube doesn't exist, classic. Why not? Because of this. Oops. Because we never act reactivate it, right? A 
forget the errors, they're wrong. <laughs> Shouldn't, don't, don't mean to argue with the compiler, but it is wrong in this instance. Oh, now why has the cube not arrived? Gather cube. Game object set active. If quest state is not started, tell you what, it's, if these are easier. If it's started, then set it as active. If it's not started, otherwise it must be not started, which means it could be a load of other states. Um, but that's okay. False. I'm getting tired now. Look, I'm writing else instead of false. Yeah, <laughs> and another valid point, right, which you're getting here from Grasshopper. Great to have all these people around to help, uh, is that once I set the game object inactive, then the update is never getting called. So that's a, uh, probably a good clip, guys. I'll do it as well, just click the clip button. But the problem with me clipping, clip it, clip, uh, clicking clip is that I then don't have the time or the bandwidth to go and name that clip and share it. So if you guys want to, that's awesome. So yes, if we make it inactive, it's never shared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back out of hiding it if it's not uh, for the moment altogether, just by commenting out. And we're just going to focus on finishing what we're doing and then that code's there to either remove or to change into a future action. The point that I want is I want to be able to hit it like this. I want it to do nothing unless the quest is active. And then if the quest is active and I go to gather the cube, I want it to do something. And we have a script error. The message parameter has to be of type collision. Ha, ah, you see? And this is why... Now shall copy and paste messages. Um, and I disobeyed my own advice and created the error that I knew would happen. So let's test. I hit the quest item. Sure, we should probably hide it. Let's not worry about that for the moment. On collision, enter. Look, I'm going to go and copy and paste the message. <laughs> this is why you copy and paste messages. So unity on collision, enter. You don't just try and guess at what the message name is because you get no autocomplete help, or certainly I don't. Um, so just go get this thing, get it all spelt right. Take the private off it. So I'd spelt something wrong there. And then um, we're off a way to go. Why take the private off? It's a message. I like messages to be neither private nor void, just so they're conspicuous. Yeah, oh, neither private nor public, rather. Um, right. Script error on collision enter. Now, this is a really weird error. This is a well, weird error now because it's not telling me which script it's even in. So just save all. Is it in another script? No. Um, the message parameter has to be of type collision. Um, it is. Uh, now I don't know what I need to do. Need to save the script I have. This is like it's a, is it an old error? But it's private without the private being there. Yes, absolutely, ab zero. So just to, just to clarify that, I have a, and I can probably show it to you. Um, MB header nah, gist. What's my gist? Uh, MB gist. Just trying to share something with you. Yeah. Go to that gist. That gist will open up um, a bit of code. And it's just a comment that you can put at the top of your classes. And that is how I'm suggesting we lay out the top of our classes these days in this order. Configuration parameters first private instance variables for state, any cache references, and then messages, then public methods, then private methods. That's the bit I want to highlight. So I'm just saying that I'm going to leave engine messages first because they're the thing we're least in control of. Then we're going to make public methods and we're going to explicitly call them public, whatever. And then we're going to write private for the privates. And that just means at a glance you can see messages, not only from their order, but from their uh, protection modifier, uh, and then public and then private. It's just a kind of habit I'm getting myself into to, to make things quicker and easier to read. You're quite right. If you don't say anything, then it is still private regardless. Okay. But you see the thing about this, this message is it private method that can get called from anywhere. Well, from the engine, but I can actually call this from anywhere in C sharp because I can use the reflection system to do it. So that's why we take the modifier off. It's kind of neither private nor public because it's being called regardless of whether you put private in it. Um, and um, yeah, and it's at the top because we're least in control of it. So that's what I'm doing in terms of a, a kind of uh, a habit. Now, where's this an error coming from. I, I just think this is rubbish. I'm just going to close Unity. I just don't believe it. It doesn't even tell me what script. Well, I mean, what's he talking about? Script error. Don't tell me which script needs to be collision. What? I mean, I think it's like it's kind of remembered something about the state of this script when I got the message wrong, and it's not letting me go. Yeah, so the classifications. Um, 
I can talk you guys through that if you'd like me to, if you would say so, or cheer. Here you go, give us a few bits if you want. Um, use one of the new cheer icons anyway. I'll, I'll go through script structure with you again. Dude! On collision, enter. Why are you not telling me which, which code file this is in? Okay, let's look for all on collision enters. Huh, really? Is it only one? Come on, what am I doing wrong here? Um, void on collision enter, blah. Yeah, you should take me to the problematic line if I double click on it. Look, it, oh, it is now. Have I just done something else daft, like a, I don't need all this stuff. Um, okay, these sort of weird things happen. Just come back and just go print collision or something like that. Just strip it back to super co simple code, just in case the error is somewhere else, and try again. Do I find that most developers agree with me with the leaving off private? Um, well, and messages, I don't know. It's up to them. They can agree, disagree. It's just a convention for me. Look, it's neither private nor public. How is it being called from the outside when it's private? If I put private here, and not that it's working, but if it was working, if I put private here, it'd still be called through the reflection system. So I don't, I mean, it's neither private nor public. So I would say it's neither. So take it off. Um, that's, that's my reasoning. So you can argue with it, sure. But I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and with, with the, um, with your methods you write, I, what, what I want to do is if I write a private method, I'm going to go private void, you know, some helper method like that. And I'm going to write private because private, you've already written all this boilerplate. You might as well word the, write the word private and be explicit. And then all of my publics are going to go public, you know, int whatever, whatever return something, etc. Right, because I've already written all that. I'm not going to write private and public on all my instance variables, by the way, because we're never going to use public up here for a start. And, I'm, and if I've got loads of state variables with my MB header, this thing, then I'm not going to write private in front of all of them because it's not worth the overhead. The overhead of writing private int, you know, or float, you know, uh, float height. I, private's taken up half the characters nearly of that. I don't want to write that every time. They're all private by default. I don't want to write it. With a method, sure. It's, it's a small percentage of the amount of code I'm writing when I define a method or declare a method. Um, so it is worth writing. So, I mean, you yeah, know, whatever. I'm just trying to keep it human, man. Anyway, what's wrong with this stupid thing? Is this a script error? The message type has to be of type collision. What? what, what? I'm doing something really daft. Guys, what's going on here? Could it because it requires... Don't think so. Thanks for suggesting it, but I don't think so. This is a really weird one. Oh, look, okay, let's binary search for it. Okay, let's bisect the space. Take this code out. Does that fix it? Um, unexpected symbol end of file. So it is as if I've got something wrong with my bracketing. I have got a bracketing issue, um, and I think that was the issue, actually. It just was misreporting completely. I think I just had a missing closed bracket. And this is because we are in a namespace, and if you switch from a project where your, your stuff, uh, really? No, what? Shut up. Overtyping is better than undertyping, indeed. Look, I'm doing it again. Uh, am I doing it again? I'm over indented here. No, no, I'm over bracketed. I'm over indented. I'm getting tired. This is the basic simple problem. Uh, let's take this code out, and then the class should be OK as empty. And then let's see if we still get the error. We don't get the error. And then if I go to Unity's docs and grab a void on collision enter example and do nothing with it apart from close the braces, it really ought not to complain. And it does. This is just wrong. This is just a bug, right? Is it just a bug? I mean, what is going on there? This has just, I think, got to be a bug. Is it actually a collision? Well, it doesn't matter. This is a message. I mean, I'm at liberty to write this message into here. Uh, it will be a collision because I've turned off trigger on 
here, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm perfectly at liberty to write this message in here and hope that it gets called. And Unity's coming along and complaining that the, the, that the message... Ah! Wow! No, 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 no! Look at that! I'm just going to sit back... Tell me what's wrong. I know what's wrong now. This is cool. This will be worth clipping at the end. We have a namespace clash, don't we? Yeah, keel block. Good job. Big thumbs up. Namespace clash. I haven't been entirely comfortable with this being called collision for a while. I think one of the reasons is I'm kind of in the back of my mind. I'm like, hang on. This, now, now there's two ways. This is colliding with Unity's type called collision. Right, and what's happened inside uh, wherever we were, trying to do something seemingly simple. Where were we? Uh, gather. Seemingly simple is if you hover over this, this resolves to rpg.quest.collision. Now, I think what I'm going to do in this case is just say no. That's not what I want. It's unity engine.collision. And that will solve it, by the way. And then I'm going to put a Y as not to clash. Now, should I go and rename this collision class? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because every time I copy and paste this message, I'm going to get this collision, uh, this namespace collision. Okay, and it's looking inside its current namespace first before it goes up here and uses Unity Engine. So that will solve it, um, sure as sure as day. And then I'm going to rename the class. Pretty cool, eh? Pretty cool. Clip that, guys. Clip that and share it. Uh, nasty. Uh, don't name your classes the same as something that you commonly use in Unity, particularly when it's a type that's part of a message like this. All right, that was what was going on. Really interesting problem. Okay, so I, the, the root cause solution here is I'm going to call this a, um, it's a collect, isn't it? It's different to gather. Uh, no, it's a, it's a reach, it's a trigger. It's a trigger. This is just a trigger. This is what type of collision, uh, this is a trigger quest. So I'm going to just rename it trigger. Uh, trigger, is trigger used in Unity? Is it a type in Unity? I don't know. Try, just, just type trigger. No, okay. Is collision? Um, yes, you see it goes blue. So that's one thing you can do before you create a new class, just do that. Should have, probably slightly surprised it didn't warn me at the time here. It could have helped me out and warned me and said, hey, this is going to conflict with, with the other type, but it didn't. Anyway, let's fix it. Trigger. Boom. Very interesting. I am going to commit this. So uh, just make sure that our behavior works. I mean, it doesn't completely work, but let's just make sure that where we are works. And then I want to commit this interesting namespace clash as soon as I've got working code. There you bugger. So what happened there um, is I made a fake bridge. It used to have a script and the way I renamed it broke it. So the, the uh, fake bridge was an escort and the um, Escape detectors should have this um, trigger script on them. Uh, and that, that might be it. Yes, it is the type of namespace collision that we've been warned about at the start of the Unreal course, precisely. Yeah. So we have a block. We touch the block, and what happens? Not a lot. Well, we get a collision. I say, you're on and the then right I go and get this quest, the gather the cube. We look in the world to see what the quest status is to gather the cube. It's now started and I go to the cube. I don't know what code state I'm in and what happens. Well, nothing because why? Uh, because the gather quest, at the moment I have just commented out the code, which is fine because we wanted to make sure we were on the right code path. So if it started, you destroy the game object, we put it in inventory later and we complete the quest. If this works, we're going to uh, commit and then we're going to worry about putting the object in inventory later. How's the, how's the commit message looking? It says that we should upgrade Unity version. We did more than that, so, and started um, gather. Don't mind doing two things, it doesn't really matter. The upgrade of the Unity version was pretty minor. How my radio mic batteries? I've got new batteries. By the way, if you want the best batteries around, um, you want um, rechargeables, that is. You want any Loop Pro, I would suggest, these things. It sounds like a weird brand. They're actually made by Panasonic. They're the best batteries I've ever found. Um, why? Because they last a long time, they have very low self-discharge, they never kind of die. The Amazon value rechargeable batteries, they suck. 
properly. I mean, if you discharge them too much, they stop working. The only way to bring them back to life is to what I call Frankenstein them with another battery, which is where you get two batteries, one charged and one not working. One so low it won't charge. You put them together and put tin foil on the top and bottom like this. Not this way around, but positive, you know, so that they're in the same orientation. And then what happens when you short them like that, with two pieces of tin foil top and bottom, is that the battery that's good will bring will charge the battery that's bad back well enough to wake the chemistry back up and then you'll be able to charge it. You don't get that problem with any loops. The white any loops are just as good, they're a little bit cheaper um, and they are awesome as well. So look for any loop, E-N-E-L-O-O-P batteries, they are awesome. If I had more slots in my gear thing on the Amazon Prime, uh, on the front of the Twitch page, I would um, I would be putting those in there. They're very, very good. I'm just trying the black ones basically because they look better in my mic pack, in my little radio mic pack, which I might just take off my belt, this thing sits on my belt and that's how you're hearing me and they're black instead of white for Nick that's ridiculous isn't it but anyway plus they last a bit longer and these mic packs are super critical that if they die in the middle of a stream then you can't hear me it's doing this again what why are you doing that again you can't be doing that again that doesn't make any sense you're welcome well, I don't friend, know if I have added I, them. I have added the battery charger to the page, by the way, the Twitch page. If we look at Twitch, I don't know how the errors come back. That is super. I changed the type to trigger. On the parameter, on collision enter method, the parameter is trigger instead of collision. Yeah. Thank you. Thou shalt copy and paste. That's because the commented code, before we found the error, the commented code had the wrong thing. So, okay, cool. That's um, not this. I was going to show you a couple of things. Basically, my gear down here, really cool battery charger. This type of battery charger, smart chargers, um, like, like this guy here. I recommend if you use batteries for work, you grab something like that. At least eight, if not 16 cell. Good charger. And just store your batteries on there. Just have a like abundance mindset, right? Bunch of batteries sat, sit on the charger. You can see their charge state. Just leave them on there and, uh, you know, it's both battery storage and battery charging. That's that thing. Um, the AnyLoop batteries, I don't have room to put it on here. I probably should actually put them on there. Um, I could. It's really easy, I think, actually. I think it's really, really easy for me to do that. You can have a behind the scenes and see how easy it is if we like. But no, that's too much of a squirrel. I'll add them later. Anyway, thank you for that. Um, let's just uh, not copy and paste the message because I can't be bothered. So, collision. That's bad, by the way, from an attitude point of view. Okay, this should work now. Why are you grey? Because we're never using it. Yeah, that's quite typical. We might use it later. Do you need this, by the way, here? The answer is you don't. One simple solution is just take it out. The message will still get called if you don't put any parameters in there. And if you're not using the parameters, there's something to say for just avoiding this whole issue. Um, which would have avoided the entire issue, by the way, but we wouldn't have learned anything. We'd have avoided the entire issue if I would have put no parameters, but we wouldn't have learned anything. So if I touch that puppy, nothing happens. If I go get the quest and touch this puppy, boom, it disappears and the quest ends. Awesome! Woohoo! That is success. I'm going to commit that and then we're going to finalise, which is getting it into the inventory, which is a bit later. So let's do that. My feed keeps pausing on regular intervals. Anyone know why I don't seem to have a subscribe star? You do have a subscribe star, Coda 100. And thank you very much for being a subscriber. Um, yeah, really interesting problems. This is the stuff, by the way, you guys get to miss, which sounds like an opportunity. You get to miss out on all of this interesting stuff in the courses because we don't put it all in necessarily because we're just like, oh, well, you know, let's not take them down that blind alley. So this is why these streams are worth being on. So, yeah, I see your star, don't worry about it. I'm going to go for a quick break, um, not for very long. Is there anything physical you want to see me do on the break? I want you guys to do something physical yourselves, but is it uh, trampolining, handstands? Um, I can't really do much handstands here, sensibly. It's not, they're not very exciting anyway. Handstands downstairs are exciting. They're exciting and dangerous. Um, maybe you guys could help uh, Meticus, met 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 something like that, to catch up with what we've been doing on the stream. You can also see, of course, on the repo what we've been doing on the stream. Thank you very much to all of you who put donations into the jar. That is awesome. Really cool. Um, I've got to go. I've got to go to the loo. That's why I'm just kind of moving left and right like this. So um, let me know in the chat, perhaps, um, what you'd like to see me do on the break physically, if anything. Could be pogo sticking, handstand, walking, or more trampolining. 
I'll, so that it's not silent. Oh man, I'm walking funny. Really need the loot. Um, let's just play the game. All right, be back soon. I've got the chat open on my machine here. Ugh. I must remember to mute as well, because as I walk further away from the computer, the risk is in a minute you'll hear me flushing the loo. So I'm going to mute. I'll see you in a bit. I am back. I'm, I'm nearly going to end for the day shortly. I'm just ca catching up on a few questions. On Slack. Any of you guys use Slack for work? Um, Rick's saying he was too tied up to join the stream. Um, Typing. Apparently, Python 3.7 has new typing, optional typing, they call it. 
Uh, that's cool. All right. Anyway, I just like a bit more typing so that we can do we can do refactoring. I like that stuff. So we didn't really have a very good break, did we? I'm just going to catch up on the chat um, in terms of we didn't do anything physical. Um, I'm glad you're continuing Terravice to build a game that's taking the rip out of me. That's fine. Um, yes, the cam link is a very cool thing, that piece of gear that converts this camera into a USB camera. Basically, you can make amazing webcams with it. Um, posted to Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we're all chatting away. Still got 55 people on the stream. Fantastic to have you here. We've got this gather quest uh, a little bit of the way down the road. We have managed to get to the point where this cube is kind of just a dead object until this dude uh, asked me to gather the cube, and then I go and gather the cube and I succeed the quest. I don't have the cube now, but I don't know if I care. Do I need to have the cube? I guess I could ask, ask Rick whether we even need that functionality of me having the cube. It kind of sucks if I don't, but we'll, we'll just put a to-do in that says, um, put, we already got it, put the object in inventory. Good, we don't have inventory yet. So cool, we've done gather, guys. We've done gather as far as I want to do gather at this minute. We'll put it in inventory when we have kind of uh, real player inventory, although we do, we could do a little bit of that. What have we got from a player inventory point of view? We've got player, player inventory. Should we allow ourselves to add game objects? Can we even do that? Let's just try doing something very generic. Public void add to inventory a game object. So what happens there? It's a bit weird. Oh, can't use object because it's a reserved word. Can I have is this crazy? Is this is it crazy for me to have its state? Is it crazy for me to have a list of game objects called inventory? Part of which, you know, inside of that might be coin. Um, and to just say inventory dot add game object, what's gonna happen here? Go into debug mode, and now if, if, this is a bit weird, I'm just thinking in generic terms, if we would actually just put game objects in, then in gather, if before we destroy it, we add to the inventory, this is a bit weird, let's, let's have a look, what are we seeing on here? Uh, being a tier three subscriber gets you access to Tuesday's Meet the Mentors, I am putting together a game where you see Ben do a handstand walk, see those videos, so I've been taking it about blah blah blah, <laughs> yes, it's been really funny that, it's been really cool. So let's say that gathering needs to know about um, the characters. So using RPG.characters, which makes sense if we're going to gather, that's OK. Uh, and then we're going to go and say uh, find object of type player control. How do we normally do that when you have to have a character involved? Um, we do this tag. So let's just see what happens here then. So we're going to go and go find the player, then we could go player.getComponent uh, inventory, player inventory, dot add inventory, add to inventory, this thing, the actual, no, not game object, uh, what we collided with. So this is where we need collision, collision. And then we could say var item collided with equals collision dot game object. And then we add to the inventory the item that was collided with and then destroy. That doesn't make sense. What am I talking about? Gather is on the cube. Therefore, what we're adding to the inventory is ourselves. Ignore all that. And then destroy it. Now, if we go in debug mode and look at the player, what sort of data has he got on him? This seems a bit crazy, adding a, a, a list of game objects. But it would be the most gen general way to, to do this. So inventory is empty right now as a state. Collide with a cube, inventory is going to stay empty. I'm looking here in the inspector on the middle of the right-hand side. Go click on this dude, gather the cube, go over here. Now, I didn't think it was going to work straight off. We have a not set to an instance of an object add to inventory um, on line 15. Mm -hmm.
just not destroy. This could be a timing and sequencing thing. I think it's a bit weird and risky to be adding whole game objects, but it'd be the most... If we add the... And we also got to think about the amount of memory that's going to take and, and yada yada. But the uh, quite interesting idea for inventory to just contain game objects. So I'm just kind of playing with different ways that we might want to do this. So no reference exception at player inventory 24. Let's have a look. <laughs> That's me pretending that, uh, that I hadn't done something stupid there. Thanks, guys. Rookie error. Good job, though. Good spot. There you go. The inventory's actually got a cube in it. A reference to the cube in the world, though. If I then, if I then go ahead and destroy the cube, of course, we know what's going to happen. We're going to have trouble. Um, we're going to have a null reference again. So let's look at it. Break it down one step at a time. Do we leave it in the world? Do we leave it in memory? No, ultimately, we need to collapse it down to its essence that matters once it's gone. But if I do that, it goes. Now, if I go look at the player, we're going to have a null reference again. It's not going to cause a particular problem. But if we look at the player's inventory, it's going to be a missing game object because we destroyed it. So we could, inventory could stay in the world as non-active. That's pretty minging. But it would at least mean we can reach into that game object and get any information we need from it. Otherwise, we have to write code that strips off what we think is relevant about the game object and uses it. We could um, not destroy the game object at all. We could just say, um, we could do that, which is kind of weird. Uh, but let's have a look. So if we were to do what I'm doing now, then we go get our quest, we click the cube, the cube dis appears to disappear. But the cube, if we look at the player and the player's inventory, he has got the cube in his inventory. Now the cube still exists in the world as an inactive object at a particular point in the world, which is there. Whereas it's actually in his inventory. It's kind of odd, uh, but, but it does allow us to reach into all of the state of that object as it was. We freeze it in time and it allows us to reach into the state of the object as it was when he picked it up. Um, Shouldn't the cube always exist somewhere? Well, it is in this case. He walk, the player walks around with references to the things that are in the world where they were first, where they were first um, picked up. Which, if you think about it from a game play, a game designer point of view, you know, you're playing the game, you do this, you go get the cube, you bash into the cube, you run somewhere else, and now you want to pause the game and go, oh, what's going on here, mate? Then you can say, gather the cube, and it's complete, and it's a quest, and you could say, um, Oh, what inventory does the player have? And you can go, well, he's got this gather cube, and where's that in the world? Oh, it's inactive. Why is it inactive? Oh, because we've completed the quest. Um, and, you know, here was the quest to complete, and it's complete right now. And where is it in the world? Will you go in this view, scene view, and you go find it? Oh, yeah, I placed a cube there, I remember. You could piece it all back together. It's a bit odd, but, again, there's no reason not to do it this way right now. Okay, we don't need any magic foresight. It's like, well, fine, let's do it that way. It's odd, but it, but it works. We've got all the information. We don't have to write any code to pull the information off the cube that we might want to use later. So make an empty game object bag where an object is destroyed with a new reference to a year. Yeah, we could, absolutely. But what's the problem we're trying to solve right now? Right now, this is working. Um, we'll come in and we'll do more later as we need to. I can't give you a very strong why for whatever, whatever we do that's more complicated than this. So I don't think there's anything wrong with finding the player, adding the rich game object to the inventory, and then making the game object false and leave it where it is in the world. Leave inactive ghost in scene. And then you can see where you pick that thing up from, etc. I'm happy with that at the moment. Let's see. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, let's commit it. Let's just say that that's good enough for now. And then we'll, we just want to be able and willing to completely change everything, yeah? And if we stay nimble and stay aware of the consequences, particularly of things like, you know, I've changed the name of a field and every single game object has, has been broken because of that, that's bad. That's the antithesis of this kind of lean, rapid iteration approach. But if we're very keen about things like naming and about like data migration, about when I delete something, what effect does it have? Or when I rename something, what effect does it have? 
then we don't have to be scared that we're going down a blind alley because we just keep moving and weaving. And you can, in doing so, and in allowing yourself to do these crazy things, like it was still crazy to put the blinking quest in the world as game objects. Because, you know, quests don't have transforms, so that's a bit weird. But it's still working. And it's, I'm actually liking the way it's scaling, and I'd have never come up with it if I'd have thought about it. <laughs> That's kind of the key here. There's a bunch of things that you would never come up with if you thought about them. There's a bunch of things you would never do if you thought about them for too long. So don't think about them for too long. Just do them and have the confidence you can deal with the consequences and be willing to change your mind. Don't defend your position. The moment your position starts to crumble because it doesn't make any sense, change it. Yeah? If you're willing to do that, we're in good state. All right, guys, I think we need to end this stream. I've got a phone call to make before half four. We've made pretty good progress here, I think, today. I don't know. How's the progress? Good, bound, medium? Let us know in the chat. Um, and uh, we've got weird inventory based on inactive game objects. I think that's pretty good. It's progress. We've made a bunch of commits. Um, written a bunch of code. I hate to use lines of code as a, like a, it's not a good metric, but let's, because you know, they might be, might be rubbish code, but let's see what we've done. as a summary in here. So diff stat is a text expander shortcut I have, which shows me the difference between where we started at this stream and now. We have four, deleted 48 lines of code. Good, I like deleting lines. We've added 88, good. We've, that means we've net added 40 lines of code. Uh, we've done a bunch of gather stuff. We've done coin display, which is mainly boilerplate. Player inventory, which was mainly a rename, actually, uh, but we did some on there. Yeah, it was, look, because you see all these lines of inventory have to be netted against all the lines of player inventory, so, so you have to take all those red dots. Uh, and the number of things on here is proportional to the number of lines of code, number of changes. So, All right, cool, good, nice, pushed. It's all online. You can see it on the repo here. Boom. Our next Twitch event, check out the calendar. The, it's looking a bit sparse. I'm actually going away next week. Uh, and nobody else has quite got their setups to the point where they can stream stably. So in the middle of this inventory in depth, uh, we've got visualizing flying Dalek lasers on uh, Wednesday. We will have more streams before that. Keep an eye on there. The other thing to do is follow us on Twitch, which is at Game Dev TV. We announce all the new streams as they're scheduled on there at least 24 hours before. Uh, make sure you follow us so that when we go live, you know that we've gone live. Thank you for subscribing. Remember that you can be both a Twitch Prime subscriber and you can upgrade to Tier 2. The benefits of Tier 2 are here. Um, if you want your code reviewed or you want help with the project live online, then uh, become a Tier 3 subscriber. Ask Terra Vice, it's wicked. And also Jason Lee Dev has had one of the uh, mentor sessions. Hopefully you guys are enjoying those. Uh, that's it. Keep tipping us. You can now, on the homepage, uh, you can via Streamlabs, you can donate. And you can see that based on, you just go to the bottom of the page here and you just click uh, donate to support via Streamlabs. That will come into this ugly green jar that one day won't be some ugly. Uh, next stream will be your birthday present. Awesome. Is that the Wednesday? Wednesday uh, is not, is it Wednesday Perceptual? Is that your birthday? Let us know. I'll put it in the diary if it is. Um, but that's not going to be the next stream. I'm going to stream sooner than that. So cool. Happy birthday on Wednesday to you. I'll actually be flying to America on Thursday, so I won't be streaming after Thursday. Um, cool, so good, good job. And I will see you guys soon. That was me putting your birthday in the diary. I think that's an important date, the amount of loyalty you guys have given us on, the, on here. Um, and we will see you, uh, we being me, oh, look at this, streamception. See you shortly. As I say, keep an eye on all the different features of our page. Thank you for clipping. Thank you for being here. And uh, we will see you soon.